hello. Welcome to Inside the Birds pregame live here at Rivers Casino and Sportsbook in Philadelphia, right on Delaware Ave, where Philly loves a winner. I'm Jeff Mosher from Inside the Birds, alongside my co-host Adam Kaplan. Joining us tonight, we got two former Eagles. One is running a route, and he'll probably be there in a second. The other is Eagles Hall of Fame left tackle Trey Thomas. What's up, Trey? Hey, good, man. Feeling good. Feeling great. Yeah, I appreciate yeah, you filling yeah. in. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Of course, Trey is on the Inside the Birds post-game show, so you'll be hearing from all three of us after the game. But he's filling in for Greg Cosell, who couldn't be with us tonight. Greg will be back next week. We and have, don't we have Greg later in the show, though? And we do, I, you got to let me get I, I got right. it all written. It's all but in the here, script. Though, but he's here, It's though. in the script. But he's he here, is he's here. here. He's not here, but he's here on the show virtually. So we will hear... We will hear from Greg Cosell, who's not here later in the show, and uh, our our man, our Michigan man, Jason. What up? What's up, Jason? How I'm you doing? Doing well, and yourself? I'm doing great. Thank okay. you. Doing great. Thanks for joining us. Yes, so, sir. So for our crowd to know, we already said last week, Jason Avant is also a renowned salsa dancer. Trey Thomas is a wine connoisseur. Do you know what happens when you put a wine connoisseur next to a salsa dancer? I don't, but we're about to find out. That's going to be fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Listen, we got a major, major showdown tonight. We have the 1-0 Philadelphia Eagles coming home to open the link against the Minnesota Vikings. Also a 1-0 team. The Eagles obviously coming off an impressive 38-35 win over the Lions on the road in week one. The Vikings also impressive. They were 23-7 victors over the Green Bay Packers uh, last week at their house. So we've got a lot to discuss. There's plenty going on here at Rivers Casino and Sportsbook. You got gigantic flat screen TVs. You got people filing in. You got the Eagles jerseys as everybody's getting ready for the game. You can place your wagers. You can take advantage of the atmosphere here, the leather reclining seats that I would like all of us to be sitting in right now, but this is great. This is a fantastic set. It is really football watching heaven here, folks. So you gotta come in. And you can also come and watch the show live anytime we're here. We always start three hours before kickoff. Right here at Jack's Bar and Grill, you can take advantage of the fantastic food and drink specials. If you're watching at home, please share the show, like the show, tell everybody you know about the show. Everything helps, so we appreciate it. And if you are on YouTube and you leave a comment in the chat box, we'll try to get to it. You can also leave your score prediction, and we'll try to get to that too. All right, fellas, you guys ready? Let's do it, man. Yes, we got a game to break down. Trey, what's today? It's game day. It's game day. Uh, usually you have a little more. Well, I mean, you know. as, as I get older, I start calming down a little bit, <laughs> kind of take the game in stride. Don't want to peak too early. Okay. <laughs> I, that, that's fair. Nobody wants to peak in the first quarter, right? Yeah, no. Absolutely. Okay. Um, we're going to start the show each week, and we did it last week. Trey, we'll do it again. With, with Before we get into the X's and O's, we kind of take a big picture outlook at, at what we know about the Philadelphia Eagles. So, 1-0. Um, I got to say, for being 1-0, and you guys would know what it's like as players, it didn't feel like 1-0 week in the, in, in the Delaware Valley this week. It sort of felt like, yeah, but, you know, with everything that went wrong. So, Jay, I'll start with you. I mean, I always thought the player mentality was win, win, win. But are you guys, do you, do you get hypercritical in wins as you do in losses? Well, win kind of mask all the the critical mistakes that you need a lot of times the, the coaches are happy and sometimes the players are happy but it just masks some of the mistakes mistakes that you made but mm -hmm. in the delaware valley people are correct because when you give up 35 points to the detroit lions but it turned out that the lions got a it looks like they can a, play. A, a win versus the the commanders and mm -hmm. it, our, our victory looks a little bit better but all in all, the defense didn't play the way that we wanted them to. Also, I, I, my concern was mainly with um, Garner Johnson at safety. That was my main concern. Right. Was you guys talked about it last week. I give you guys a lot of credit for it. Concern with moving from nickel to safety. And to me, he looked abysmal at times. How so? Well, he, was, he didn't recognize crack blocks on three different occasions, right? So he was able to get, get, get crack. And that's one of those things that a safety is taught like not to ever get blocked by a receiver. And, he, and it was, you know, Amon Ross St. Brown. It's not like it's a big dude or anything like that. Like it was, you know, A.J. Brown out there, like manhandling him in practice. It's not like that. It's a small guy. And also, when it came up to, to just making one-on-one -on -one tackles in space from that position coming down, he missed it a lot. And I would say probably 100 yards was directly correlated to him being not being in position when it came to making a play. Now, 
that's not saying the defensive line didn't struggle and all those things, but when it came to just safety play, it was a little less than to you know to be desired. And we're going to get into that as we get along. Trey, I want to ask you, what, what you did the post-game show with us. You had a few feelings on, on Jalen Hurts and taking hits that we'll get into. But in general, were you more impressed or more concerned after a week one win? I was a little concerned. You know, when you look at the offense, of course you see Jalen Hurts. He takes all the hits that he was taking in that game. Um, I thought some of the protection issues that were out there, you know, uh, well, you got seven guys, and this is something that I would talk to you about, Jalen. Because I mean, because I mean, Jason, because with you being a receiver, you know, to me it seems like when you got seven guys up on the line and you see that nickel about to blitz and you a slot receiver, why are you not breaking off your route? Why are you not giving us a hot route? And you saw way too many times when they would bring six, seven guys, and there were no options for Jalen to to look for. Right. You know, I mean, you know, you got receivers out there just running 30 yard routes just getting good cardio yeah <laughs> and i mean i need you to break give me a quick little five yard route let's get rid of the ball because right now the quarterback is in danger right you know and most blitzes are going to come from the passing strength and you saw the nickel coming why was that slot receiver not just giving me a quick awesome. little out awesome. something to give a high so that Jalen so, can get out of there but so so, so the, the sort of the the confines of the offense is up for discussion here whether it's site adjustments calls versus certain blitzes what receivers are doing we, we're going to get into that we go to the extra nose. So that's one of your, your concern is the tackling from the secondary, specifically being a small guy who hasn't played safety. Yours offensively as far as routes versus certain, certain blitzes and what's going on there. I want to ask Adam in general, um, what are you looking for tonight against this Vikings team? As we take a big picture look, what, what's on your mind first and foremost? Well, for the, when you look at, see, you can't let one game think that's the way it's going to be. So right. the Vikings feasted on Aaron Rodgers, right? Well, why did they? Both tackles for the Packers were out. Bakhtiari's out with his knee injury. Jenkins, who played last night, did not play. He, he also has come back from an ACL injury. And then John Runyon Jr. left the game with a concussion. He did play last night. So, mm -hmm. yeah, they made Rodgers hold on the ball long. They struggled a bit. But you can't think that's the You can't think you're going to have that kind of luck because the Vikings now, if you look at their situation, they're healthier on the offensive line. Both teams, as a matter of fact, are healthy. So injuries are not going to be a factor in this game. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to win on both sides of the football? Right. One week does not have anything to do with the next. You've got to look at it that way. It's not like, gosh, the pressure they got against Goff was fantastic. It was in the first half. Mm -hmm. because they made them hold on the ball. They, uh, they were more disciplined in the second half. They were not disciplined. And then on the other side of the football, you can't you know that you're facing the same scheme you have on defense. Right. It's Fangio defense versus Fangio defense. I, as we explained last week, not every Fangio disciple runs it the same way. Correct. But you just have to, you have to know that it's not going to be the same. So what are you going to do differently to win this game? I think sometimes coaches get into this situation where they think everything's the same, we're going to run what we run. Yes, you run your principles, but you have to change it up a little bit. Sure, sure. Um, Guys, real quick, on Monday nights, I'm just curious from both of you, did you enjoy Monday night football, not enjoy playing Monday night, or ambivalent about it, Jay? Well, I'm a receiver, and receivers likes to be seen. You know, we, we look good, we play fast, you know, everybody wants to come to the game to see us. So what that means is, is that the national television audience is there to see us. So yes, we love playing on Monday nights. I think Trey, yeah, Trey is about to yeah, smack yeah, that's it. You know what you're saying? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? You do, you do, looking, but, looking big but, and sexy. but the camera going to be on us more. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's true. That's what about true. from a preparation standpoint, though, and, and just your average routine's a little bit different? I mean, all it does is just push everything back an extra day. Uh -huh. You know, so I always enjoy Monday night's games because it's the only game that's on. You know, well, it used to be. I mean, now you have two games on tonight. But um, it was the only game on. So it was just like, you know, it was a, a huge moment for us as sure. players to be able to play on that Monday night game. And, it was, you know, you had a little bit more energy going into that game. Yeah, yeah it's a performer's game. Like, yeah. so if you're, if you're, if you like, like the lights, you like the big show, and you step up in big moments, you're going to love that game. Yeah, everybody remembers the Monday Night Massacre game, right? Chip Kelly's first game, Ooh. Washington. That was yeah. Monday night, I believe. Well, right? At Washington, yeah. in fact, at that's Washington? that is when some people with the Eagles then thought that Mike Shanahan had his players take longer to get up because the Eagles were going so fast. Right. They denied that, but it sure looked like they were. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it should be a great game. Obviously, the Vikings-Eagles games over the last few years have been pretty exciting, including, of course, 
the 2017 NFC Championship game. My big picture take is that I'm a little worried about the defense, guys, only because I think I saw things that just aren't correctable from one week to the next. You know, we saw last year that this is how the run defense started, and it took them six weeks, some scheme change, and some personnel change to get it right. I didn't think that we were going to see uh, an effort or lack thereof like that last week. So we'll see how fast the Eagles can figure it out. But obviously, Minnesota's run game is one of their the strengths of that team. So we will see. Let's get into the injuries right now because it's not too bad for either team. We know the Eagles lost in week one Derek Barnett. Uh, he is out for the year. He tore his ACL. You know, Derek had kind of went down the list of pass rushers when they added, brought on Hassan Reddick and they changed their scheme up a little bit. Brandon Graham comes back. But nonetheless, he's one of their few kind of hand-in-the-dirt defensive ends with experience. Brandon's a little older. You got Josh Sweat as another. It's really just three natural hand-in-the-dirt style defensive ends that they're they're down to, along with Teron Jackson, who hasn't played very much. How, how big of a uh, de deficiency do you think that is? I thought this was one of their strengths. I don't think that losing Derek Barnett would be a big deal. Um, seeing that, you know, some of their snaps, they're dropping some of the defensive ends or the outside linebackers in the coverage, right? So these guys are not getting many rushing opportunities as it is today. Right. So this is only going to give those guys more opportunities. So I don't think it's a problem at all losing Derek Barnett, just in general. My problem with it is I look at the technique of it. And when you have rushers that get in the same stance every time, Everybody lines up with their inside foot back as rushers. And I mean, you know, they're getting their, in their stance. If they're on the, the right side, then their left foot is back. If they're on the side, either way, their inside foot is back. Mm -hmm. So they're always going to make contact at the same spot. And you're starting to see where offensive tackles that understand how to count steps are going to jump them mm -hmm. or they short set them and it shuts them down before they can get started. When you look at Hassan Reddy, and I love him as a rusher, but he's the type of player that has to build up that momentum. You saw the tackles last week just set him at a 45. They shut him down before he gets started. Mm -hmm. BG, same way. Mm -hmm. um, Josh Sweat, he, you know, they, the one rush he had early in the series, he gave the guy a little edge move. But after that, they started just short setting him and they shut him down until he had that one other rush where he beat the guy inside. Right. So to me, it's just everybody's doing the same thing. And if you don't change it up, at least change up the stance a little bit you're going to have tackles just short set you and then you're not going to create pressure. Adam, we talked earlier in the week about one thing that Derek Barnett did provide that people probably didn't either see or respect enough is that he's a pretty good run defender. And of course, run defense wasn't really their finest last week. No, it was, but as a force player to, to funnel things inside, he's actually, for a guy who had shorter arms, yeah. not bad at it. And it also hurts your rotation. But I, I agree with Jason, it's not, it's not going to be sort of like discernible, like you're going to go, okay, Boy, this is really bad. He's not a very good pass rusher. Right. He never became really the pass rusher that they thought coming out of Tennessee. True. But it does hurt your rotation. So that's one thing to look at tonight. And remember, earlier in the season, coaches are trying to figure out what the rotation is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the funny thing last week is, and this is one of the big surprises, despite them not getting home, those had the third highest blitz percentage at 25.6. So... We'll see what they do, but they just weren't getting home last week. They were not. Um, other than that, though, the Russell better looks... offensive lines in football that was there too. Give that, give yeah, that credit. Yeah, give yeah, them credit. Yeah. Other than that, Eagles are very healthy. Uh, we're seeing a lot of major injuries already happen across the league. First and second, Trey Lance yesterday going down. Uh, we've seen that. Dak Prescott going down. So Eagles are happy to say that they have nobody on the injury report for this game under the injury designation. Jack Stoll had an ankle thing, but he seems fine, so he'll be ready to go. Uh, and same thing with the Vikings, really. I don't think anyone is out other than Andrew Booth, their rookie cornerback, who's a backup cornerback. B.C. Johnson is now out for the year with an ACL. Yeah. He's, been, he's been out for the year with and, an ACL. And by the way, that probably had something to do with the trade for Rager, in addition right. to him being able to return. I know we're going to have some notes on him tonight, but it is interesting. The guy to watch out at, I know he, hasn't, he didn't do much in week one. It's K.J. Osborne, who they really like as their third receiver. Yeah. The, the thing about the Vikings is they have the ability to spread you out with their receivers, plus Irv Smith. And of course, Dalvin Cook will get into it later. So the, the chess match, this is what makes this matchup tonight so intriguing. Yeah. Is, is both coaching staffs have a lot to work with here. It's fascinating. Absolutely. All right, real quick on the Vikings. Uh, their pass rusher, DJ Wanham, is dealing with a foot, but he should be fine. Safety, Lewis Seen from Georgia, the rookie. Ooh. He is dealing with a knee injury, but he is expected, I believe, to play. He's their first-round pick who's first got size. Pick, right. He's the guy you can use in the box. I know Cosell, Greg likes him a lot. 
This is interesting. Yeah, well, this should be his debut tonight, and he'll give them a different look. Now, the Eagles signed a defensive end off the Vikings practice squad this week after Derek Barnett went down. His name is Janaris Robinson. He was a fourth-round pick last year of the Vikings. So you guys have seen this new coaching staff comes in. Guy's not very good for a year one. They give up on him quickly. But I wonder, I'm sure this has happened while you guys played, where a team signed a player from the team you're about to play. How much of that is getting some information and how much of it is valuable? The thing is, is that it happens throughout the year. All the time. All the time. Yep. And yes, you get information out of it, but remember, it's a player and they're not is they're not going to be as adept as a coach would be in, in, in explaining everything right. to the coaching staff. So what, mo what happens most of the time is that they have you chasing goats, yeah. right? So, <laughs> hey, we did this, we did this, we did that. And that defensive coordinator, that offensive coordinator from the team that they came from knows that they know the information. So why not switch it up for this game and have you second guessing this player's, you know, information? I, I think that only really works if you, if you sign a quarterback. I mean, you sign a defensive man. Like, what, what, what is he going to tell you? I mean, he, he says, oh, hey, man, I got this call right here. I either run a stunt or I take my man by himself. You know, right. I see ball get ball. I hit the quarterback. Yeah, I mean, you know, come on. I mean, what can he tell you? Right. Six <laughs> signals, like for a receiver, signals can be very, very important. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you if you sign a receiver and a receiver's been there long, if you get a signal, it could be it can mean something, you know, pretty important. Sure. You know? Sure. The tells, as they like to say. Yeah. Uh, also, the Eagles did elevate oh, yeah. for the second straight week. Tight end Noah Togiai was a big part of their Togiai, big part of their 12 personnel and their blocking. And uh, they elevated Britton Covey, the rookie free agent, to return punts. He returned punts last week. How many elevations did he get, Adam? Three per. I, it was three. I don't know if they raised it to four I yet. I think well, it was three or four. Right. Yeah. It's definitely. It's always been three. But he'll he'll serve as the fifth receiver. But I, the, what I find fascinating is because we had said last Sunday when they when they, we knew who, who they elevated. We know Covey will be the punt returner. Does Tungiai mean more running? Well, it sure did. Mm -hmm. And they ran all over Detroit, which is, sh I, look, not that Detroit has a great front. It's just, what is the, see again, what will be their approach? Will they come out throwing, passing? They still hurts through oh, 32 times, I think, which is a good number. Yeah. I, I'm just interested to see what the approach is going to be tonight. Well, well you and my and about millions of Eagles fans, of course, the Eagles will come home tonight, and they open up the link for the first time this year. I don't know if you guys remember, but the link was not very kind to the Eagles last year, or maybe it was vice versa, because the Eagles lost their first four home games mm. at the link. They did not win until, I believe, the New Orleans game, which was in November. Jeez. Late November is how long it took the yeah, Eagles to get their against first Trevor Simeon. home win. Yeah, and against yeah. Trevor Simeon. Really? Wow. I remember even, even some mediocre teams of the, of the past would still give teams a difficult time at home. But last year, that was not the case. I mean, you guys had a thing when you played. Like, people don't come into the link, no matter what your record is, and leave, like, beating their chest. But that was happening a lot last year. Was that surprising? Always surprising when, you, when a team feels like that they own the link. You know, that's just not the standard that's been set by this gentleman and that group, that Super Bowl group. So um, you hate to see that type of thing. Yeah. Trey, was that, did it bother you to see? I, mean, I know losses always bother you, but at the link in particular where teams are just coming in? Yeah, no, you never wanted to see that happening on your home field. I mean, you know, this is our house, and we want to make sure that that – that that is what, how they come out of the game feeling that, you know, that they've been whooped on every level. So uh, that's something that that's a mindset. And I think that the head coach here, Nick, is trying to build that up here. And we'll see, man. Right, right. Well, listen, we know the crowd's going to be rocking tonight. Oh, yeah. They'll be very opinionated as they always are. And got to say, the crowd has been opinionated all week. And a lot of their opinions were funneled at what we talked about. And that's defensive coordinator Jonathan Gannon, even in a win. The Lions ran for 180 yards and averaged six and a half yards per carry. So, Trey, you know, we, you, you love trench talk, so we might as well get into the trenches. Because even before we get into the, the secondary or the size issue or Chauncey as, as a tackler, there were just times where I saw the two guys in the middle, whether Javon Hargrave or Fletcher Cox, cleared out there, yeah. sometimes by a tight end, Trey. So yeah. I'm wondering what you observed there and why that happened. I mean, you saw Detroit just go out there. Now, you got to understand, now, you got Hank Fraley's offensive line coach there, you know, somebody that's been around the game for a long time. 
played a lot of years under Juan Castillo, you know, really understands the, the game and how to get his guys going. Mm -hmm. And I thought that they did a really good job of just getting some good combination blocks on going. And then they also did a good job of knowing how that these guys are going to rush. When you got Hassan Reddy that's going to try to jet up field, all right, let him go up field, and then now you run a little counter right behind him. J Josh Sweat, when he would jet up field, he got a nice little edge rushed in the very next play. They run that little trap right up to his side, and then now the uh, running back is scatting down the field for 50 yards. So they took advantage of a lot of that. And then you even saw them sometimes where they had a, a power call to the right, all right? So you had a power call to the right. Mm -hmm. A double team is going. The guard is pulling. The running back stops and cuts it back all the way mm -hmm. to the left. Mm -hmm. How many times do you ever see a running back cut back on a power? Right. Never. No. Never. Never. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But because you don't have a defensive end on the back side, that's going to come and crash it. So when you have that type of play, you're going to get gashed. Right. This feels like the old wide nine conversations of the DNs being way too up the field and then that leaving the cutback. Like, I thought we were done with that. Oh, no. No, I guess not. <laughs> well, obviously, if a guy's cutting back, though, and getting more yards, <laughs> that means he's getting past the second level, too. So, Jay, you were talking about tackling on the back end wasn't nearly as good well, as it should have been? Well, so when, when you start to get into 20-yard runs and 50-yard runs and all those things, the defensive line is there to, to, to maintain that three to five range. But the safeties and the corners can really help you out in those areas. And when the defensive line was out of position, you had safeties that came up and came to a pause. You go and attack at safety, right? There's only a split second for you to get in position so the, so, the, so the offensive line doesn't reach you or right. someone else doesn't get up to you. So you have to go and be decisive and make a decision. And also you have to fight against pressure. When a guy's coming to block you, he's trying to wash you down so the running back can go outside of you. If you feel that you fight with pressure, put him in the hole, you take one hole, and now you give more space for corners to come up and make a tackle. We saw Bradbury trying to make one-on-one -on -one tackles. Oops. It's just not going to happen like that. The safety is the person that's the enforcer, and we didn't have that yesterday. The only time, or yesterday, the last game was was um, Epps. Epps would come down and give you give you you know some problems. Right. But he wasn't playing. Um, for, for some reason, Garner Johnson was in the box more. Yeah. And and if that person's in the box, you gotta do something better than that. So tell me this, Steph. Tell me, do you think the lack of aggression in practice leads to that? I think I think for him in particular, he hadn't played the safety position since he was at Florida. Mm -hmm. And he had three years of being in New Orleans as a nickel corner. Getting used to this again from that position, those angles, it's a way different tackle. It's just a different tackle. And so he has to get used to it. And he has to be able to see more. You got to know, oh, all right, this guy's coming in motion. And the first thing I think is crack. And if I think crack, I'm going to fight pressure into, mm. the, into the blocker and, and create and a lane. You saw it repeatedly, make... right? Yeah, it was over and over. Now, another thing for it, another thing I think was disturbing, uh, two people told me, we, we put this on a show last week, that, and you rarely see this, Cox got moved. Fletcher Cox got moved oh, off yeah. the ball. Like that, now, now let me ask you, is it That's Cox combo. X players, okay? If you have, if you put on tape like that, you, you know as a player, you put bad tape out there, aren't you going to be fired up the next game and like this can't happen again? I would hope so. I would hope so, because you look at, you know, I love Fletcher Cox. I, I love him as a player. When he wants to be an animal, he is an animal. But I need you to be that all the time. You yeah. know, like when I, I, who, who, what I love talking to guys about when they talk about Jerome Brown, because I never saw him as a player, you know, and everybody just talks about how he would wreck shop all the time. And I'm just like, man, Fletcher, I need you to be that dude every yeah. time, every week. You shouldn't be getting pushed off the ball, you know. And, and by the way, they started two backups at guard. Yeah. 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 You and can't have good. that. No. To, to, to the point on combo blocks, which I get, you're getting double team. The first big run from DeAndre Swift, which was, I think, the third play of the game. Second. Second play of the game, mm -hmm. right? TJ Hawkinson, who's a good tight end, but nonetheless a tight end, basically moved Javon Hargrave at his own will. Yeah. And that was a single block, a down block from a tight end. That's where I feel like what you're saying. Like, at some point, I don't, if you're aligned not correct, at some point there's football here. Like, you have to overpower a tight end trying to block you when you're a Pro Bowl D-tackle, right? Even, even if they get the beat on you, right? So sometimes sometimes a guy can get a wham block on you, and they may not right. see you. But when you're, an, when you're yeah. a butt kicker, right. you're going to feel that and, and, and fight against it. You can't just go with the wave. Yeah. Right. That's the thing. I, now, now, you can speak more into that. But, but, the, but yeah. my thing is with it, and this is why I keep going back to it. I think practice, man, 
Okay. I think because of practice not being as physical as it should be in training camp, you kind of get in that mode of, all right, hey, you got me. All right. You know what I'm saying? Because you don't, you never. The thud drill. Yeah. You know, everything is just, all right, hey, you block, and then it's over with. You let the guy just go. You never have those live drills where you can kind of fight against that pressure. And it's hard to flip that switch. Right. That switch does not exist to now you all of a sudden just going to be a, a, a game breaker. You know, it doesn't happen. You start playing a little soft. You start playing to how you practice. Mm. But now, hopefully, these guys will go back and you watch this film. And you say, all right, you know what? I got to find that switch and flip it. We, we kind of thought that it, for most of the NFL, the first two or three games would be like the extended preseason, yep. yeah, just yep, in general. Exactly. And you see yep. it. And you see punt returns and, and kick returns for touchdowns. You've seen blown coverages. It's some bad, like, football when it comes to just execution for everyone. Tackling. And the tackling is really bad for, most, people, for yeah. most teams. You know what was also kind of telling is in the second half, when the Eagles needed to get better in run defense, the two guys we saw out there when they were in their base front were Marlon Tui Pelotu and Milton Williams. So to your point, Trey, if I'm Javon Hargrave and I'm a Pro Bowl tackle, if I'm Fletcher Cox and I'm an all-pro tackle, and I'm noticing in retrospect the next day, hey, you know, two guys who are not nearly as accomplished as me <laughs> in their second years yeah. are on the field and clutch and I'm not, that's got to resonate in some way, doesn't it? Yeah, but that, that, Fletcher got hurt at some point. Something happened. The he knee, had a boo-boo. Right. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, so, you know, he got it healed up. You yeah. know, they put a little boo-boo spray on it, got him out of the game. You know, you could get back out there. Let's go. Right. It's not even on the injury report this week. No, nah, not even on the injury report. You're good. Well, it doesn't get easier <laughs> for the Eagles tonight Let because me. the opponent goes from DeAndre Swift, a very good running back, to – Two-time Pro Bowler, three-time 1,000-yard rusher, Dalvin Cook, uh, Cook. He had 90 yards and went for over four and a half per carry in week one. He's also a threat to catch the ball. I think people forget that Dalvin Cook was on IR when the Eagles and Vikings played in that NFC Championship game in 2017. I'm not saying it would have been a different game, but that's a weapon for them that they didn't have at that time. Adam, what has been the book on Cook over the last year or two. Tremendous acceleration, sets up his, his blocks really well. Yes, he's been hurt a lot. He's never played a full season, but he's an all-purpose back. He's bigger than his brother James, who's now with, with the Bills, and he's dangerous. Now, the, the again, I love the approach, mm -hmm. because the Vikings, now that Mike Zimmer's gone, they'll actually throw the football. So how will they come out and do it? Because you, we know Justin Jefferson, we haven't even mentioned yet, is coming to town. And Adam Thielen and Irv Smith Jr. and Dalvin Cook and this right. young offensive line. So. They've got a lot going for them, and they can win in a variety of ways. And I think the first series you're going to know. You won't have to guess. I agree. And it's going to be a lot of Dalvin Cook certainly touching the football. So the Vikings, under their new coach, Kevin O'Connell, who comes from the Sean McVay tree, right? You got touched by Sean McVay, you're a head coach. <laughs> All right? They play a lot of 11 personnel. All right? When, they, when the team's in 11 personnel, when the Lions were, the Eagles came out in a, in a sort of a nickel front, four down linemen, or three, and yeah. an overhang, right? Yeah. So, to me, you wonder, do the Vikings try to continue to spread it out and run against the nickel defense that the Eagles showed that didn't do a very good job of stopping the run last year? Absolutely. Like, you don't let them get into their 5-2 front, right? Yeah, absolutely. You, try, you spread them out, you make them play nickel, and then you, you can pick them apart because when you go back and you look at what happened against Detroit, I mean, you know, the quarterback got, they got rid of the ball. Every, everything was under two. 2.3 seconds. So, I mean, that means that your secondary is playing off. So, you're not giving your defensive line time to get there. You know, so so you can sit there and you can dink and dunk and you spread everybody out and then now you can run the ball because if you're playing nickel, that means that you only got four down linemen, two linebackers. Mm -hmm. I take my five against those six every day. Yeah. Because now the running back only has to make one miss. Right. When the Eagles played much better defense after their awful first drive, when they had three three and outs, or whatever it was, they had three where they got off in third down. Their zone drops were great because Goff was not sure what to do with the football. Uh -huh. Then the second half, they got played soft coverage, got it out, got it out, got it out. He defeated the coverage. So I'm going to be interested again to see, because Trey just talked about it, it's Eagles defensive approach here because with Thielen and all those pass options, it's not going to be easy. No, it's, it's a fascinating conversation, the cat and mouse game. Uh, our Patreon subscriber, Ganyu Amusa asked that question about, do, are you concerned about the Eagles in their nickel trying to stop the run game of the Minnesota Vikings? Really good question from Ganyu. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And of course, if you want to join our Patreon channel, you go to patreon.com slash inside the birds. We're giving you 
bonus exclusive content. We're doing two extra shows a month just for our Patreon subscribers. We're doing chats on Discord. We're doing prizes, giveaways, a chance to come watch this show up person here at Rivers Casino. So please, please go to patreon.com slash inside the birds and become a subscriber to our Patreon channel. Did you have a, I saw you put your hand up. I thought maybe you were oh, beckoning no, I was me? just fixing my jacket. Oh, okay. Exactly. Yeah. All right. No, well, I'll, I'll, add, show. I was looking for I'll, yeah, I'll add, and I don't want to go too far in the show, but I'll add that nickel defense um, is something that they should be in if you get Garner Johnson, right? So, and you have Avante. I think it's, they have to sure, sure it up, but that's something that the Vikings, they will do, and they'll do it at a high level, right? It's play, it's play zebra personnel or sure. three wide receivers. Yeah. Right. Um, I just think that Gannon has to become more aggressive. Now, not aggressive, just blitzing. Because blitzing, we saw an increase, so we can't say anything about that. Because we were one of the worst teams in the league when it came to the amount of blitzes 31st that we ran. in the league last right? year. Right, 31st yeah. in the league. Yeah. So the blitzing was good. Now you have to take chances with coverage and be able to get in someone's face. Why couldn't they get yes. home last week, guys? Why could they not get home? There's a lot of reasons why. Trade pointed to it right there. Same rush, same look, offensive yeah. line. But also the guys had a plan, a game plan, to get, get the ball out. And that's the one thing that you notice from a receiver standpoint. It's like, man, this guy's getting the ball out really fast. Well, that's why and if they're going to get the ball out yeah. really fast, you have to throw off timing. Right. And if you're, the only way you can throw off timing is if, you are, if you're willing to get in someone's face. Yeah. Now, if they're not willing to get in the face of DJ Shark and Amaron St. Brown, what do you think that they're willing to do versus Adam Thielen and they Justin press Jefferson? They press a lot. They rarely they press. Need, they, yeah. We have to in order to throw off time. You have to. You can't pay the guys the money that you're paying them and not be willing to sacrifice and put it online. You got to. It, it's no point in doing it. You might as well just go in and get a bunch of Josh Normans. B back to your point on, on run right, defense. Just, and, what, and, yeah, that what wouldn't work well here. A bunch of Josh Normans, I don't think. <laughs> we, we, I mean, they would love his we, scrappiness we here, but, you know. With this, we could have kept Steven Nelson. I, I was just going to say, I think they did that last year with yeah. Steven Nelson. Yeah, I, I'm right. just saying, if you're going to do this, you, you got to get in people's face throughout time. That's I, all I'm saying. I feel like maybe I'm eating my words from the off season and last, last week a little bit in that we all, a lot of us felt that Anthony Harris was really just a guy at safety and Chauncey Gardner was more of a coverage guy and a playmaker. But I can't help but wonder now if the plan from the Lions was, okay, you know, Anthony Harris may not have been a great cover guy, but he can come in and stop a run. And now they got a nickel corner playing safety and Marcus Epps playing safety. We think we can run on that kind of back end as long as we can get our, ourselves up through the hole. And they did. They and now you wonder, are they equipped to stop the run at a better level now? The mindset has to change for sure. Uh -huh. The mindset has to change for sure. More aggression from, from Gardner Johnson, right? He just needs to be way more aggressive, number one. And he has to, just in general, has to get used to looking at it from this perspective again. Right. Like Trey said, if you practice a certain way and all those things, it's not building you up for game reps. Maybe for a veteran is good, but for a guy that hadn't been in there in a while, it definitely didn't go well in his first, his first out. All right. Well, obviously, when a run defense falters and you have a first-round pick who's 340-some-odd pounds and only played a certain amount of snaps, to the fan eye, it seems like there's a problem there. Uh, there was a lot of calls for you got to play Jordan Davis more, you got to play him every down, what did you draft him for if he's not on there against the run? And there's a certain statistic out there that I think is misleading that we'll get into in a minute. But, Adam, we talked about this, and I want to repeat it. Why did not? Why does Jordan Davis not play, or at least in the first week, more than people were hoping? Why was again? Why was Marlon Tui Peloto ahead of him? Right? <laughs> yeah. and, uh, people are like, what? Yeah. Why, what is? <clears throat> we, we told people two months ago with Marlon Tui Peloto, this guy's going to be on the team and be a factor. Yes, we do. He's not ready yet. Jordan these Davis. guys, yes, these guys know this better than you and I do because they play it. If you're not doing what the coaches need you to do, if they don't think you're ready, you're not playing. They don't care if you're the first pick overall. Uh -huh. Mike Zimmer told me many years ago. Uh, we, were, we were talking the combine. We're just talking about philosophy and who we learned from Bill Parcells. He said, if you don't know our technique, I don't care who you are. He said, we're not putting you on the field until you get it. When they think he's ready, he's going to play more snaps. Mm -hmm. But could it happen tonight? Theoretically, sure. But you just don't throw a guy out there unless he's ready. It doesn't work like that. So, so I mean, he did not play a whole lot of snaps at Georgia. We went through this, Trey and Jay. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't know whether to say this is a failure on the coaching staff to get him ready or you have to understand that a man that size, that position, who only played 20 snaps a game at Georgia is not going to come play 55 snaps, 60 snaps in his NFL debut. Are you prepared to take Fletcher, take, have him take Fletcher Cox reps? 
Am I prepared to have Jordan Davis take Fletcher? Yeah. Well, uh, are we talking about run defense or pass defense I mean, here? Period, because you all know which one down. Well, it's clearly Milton yeah. Williams and Tui Pelota took those reps, not Jordan Davis. Yeah, I mean, is he going to take Hargrave reps? I mean, you know, because that, that's what you're saying. Right, I see what because, you're Because, I mean, yeah. it's not going to be a five down front. You know, that's not happening. We're not playing a three, four front, you know. So what you have to say is that, all right, you know what? I want him to start taking either Hargrave reps or Fletcher Cox reps. Right. Because this is a four down front, and you're going to have to play nickel today. Right. As someone, uh, before I get to you, Jay, as someone who is an extremely large man compared to me and Adam, <laughs> can, can you kind of talk about down. the challenge that even Jordan Davis has of getting himself ready to play a full, you had to play a full game. People of your size do it, but he is playing a different position and he struggled at Georgia to even mm -hmm. maintain the weight and play a full game. This feels like a organizational challenge for them to get him ready to play more. Yeah, the conditioning aspect of it is, is real. You know, just because of how the preseason was set up, you know, not a lot of the starters, guys that were perceived to be, you know, guys that would be on the team, didn't get a lot of playing time during these during those preseason games. And a lot of them took that last game off. And then you had two full weeks off before you had another game. So conditioning aspect of it is real, you know, especially when you haven't you haven't put yourself in, a, in, in, in the red yet, even in practice. So it's hard to go from that to all of a sudden now you have to go full tilt every time. You know, I think that the transition of that takes a couple of weeks to kind of get him going. Sure, sure. And when you're tired, I uh, imagine at that size, you lose your pad level, oh, yeah. you lose your technique, and you're just not as effective as you would be. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I'll say is, is that him not being ready technique-wise technique or game plan-wise, I have to throw that out the window. The reason I have to throw that out the window, it's not like it's training camp. Training camp, they give you an entire playbook and they tell you you have to learn it. So you're confused because there's so many different plays and so many looks. When you come into week one, the game plan is concise. It's very small. It's not big at all. You only have a few sets, a few plays that you have to memorize. And I'm pretty sure being at Georgia, he has some pretty advanced scheme. And just like in the NFL, he can do that. That that game plan package, I believe that he can do that. Mm -hmm. Just in my, just in my. And it's D line. Yeah, D line. It's, it's, it's not that hard. D line. So it's so, ball, get so, ball. so 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 it gets back to <laughs> so it get back to Trey's point is that are we willing to go to that next step of we drafted this guy in the first round? Is it time for him to start taking one of these guys' reps? And I think the diplomatic way and a diplomatic approach for Gannon is no at this moment in time. Right. Because it's too early in the season. Well, sure. you just had Fletcher Cox go to them what a, a year ago. And was like, look, I don't like the way y'all are using me. Who's gonna take his reps? Well, who's I gonna mean, go? Out, who's gonna go out to Fletcher Cox and say, hey, look at man, I, you're not playing to the standard that we need you to play. We're going to put the rookie in there on you. Right, you. and especially after you just re-signed him to a fourteen. It's only one game. You just re-signed him to a fourteen million dollar contract. Yeah. You basically told him how badly you wanted him back. Show me who has that dog <laughs> in their heart right now. Who got that dog in them that's gonna go tell Fletcher Cox, look here, man. We're going to need to sit you down for a little bit and let this young fella come in here and take some of your reps. Yeah, well, if Marlon Tui Pelotu is playing more snaps tonight than Fletcher Cox, uh -oh. then I think we got a real problem. <laughs> we got a lot oh, more that, things that, to talk that, about. That will be insane. I do oh, want God. to address those, the <laughs> statistic. They, immediately after the game. <laughs> it, I just got jogged, a memory jog. <laughs> Uh-oh, which one? Oh, no, go ahead. Doggone, Jeremiah Trotter got his reps taken by Omar Gaither and him lighting up Thomas to be in practice. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, it's... It, it, uh, he, uh, it was, it's out, he took it out on poor Thomas. Oh, he took it out on Thomas. Lit Thomas he, up. Lit him up. It was so loud. I thought Thomas was dead. Yeah. <laughs> lit him up. Oh, you going to take my reps? All right, somebody going to pay. Set him in the next week, huh? Oh, man. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Then you get the cycle on. Thomas thinks, well, I got to go take out Gaither's knees now. Yeah. and get Trump back in the starting lineup. Man. No, but there was a stat last after the game that came out very close that the Eagles' run defense was averaging, like, 10 yards allowed when Jordan Davis wasn't on the field and then two point something when he was on the field. So it made it look like as soon as you put Jordan Davis yeah. on the field, it was like a magic cure for the run defense. However, he only played 22 snaps. He played in goal line when the running back can only gain one yard. Yeah. Some short yarded situations that skewed the average. Uh, I watched tape, you guys did. I saw plays where the Lions busted big runs and Jordan Davis was on the field. Mm -hmm. It's not that he did anything wrong. It's just that it takes 
a total effort and you guys just put into it that one person is not going to be the cure. No. The, yeah. Jordan Davis is not going to play 10 more snaps tonight and all of a sudden the Eagles yeah. run defense yeah. is going to be to, the 85 Bears. That to, doesn't to, to be honest, when it came, I, I believe this started last year with the Cowboys comboing up and, and wiping those guys oh, out yeah. using double teams to get up and we haven't seen a bunch of improvement in that area. Right, right. So, uh, and then actually, you could argue, Jay, first half, season opener, Atlanta, Cordell Patterson and Mike Davis were carving oh. them up. Yeah. They just Touch. couldn't score in the red zone. One and then cut the up field. Yeah, one cut, bam, right up the middle. It actually took about five or six weeks. Remember, they changed the scheme. They started to play the safety in the box because he was trying to play too deep. Yeah. And they removed Eric Wilson and put um, uh, you know, Davion Taylor in. So you had Taylor and TJ Edwards tag team against the run. It gave him a little bit little more speed to the hole there. They have a they have a, a, a situation that's that's brewing and I, and I and, and it, the, the thing that's brewing is going to be Avante Maddox and Gardner Johnson. That's right. that's what's brewing because at some point if Gardner Johnson is not playing up to standard mm -hmm. and and it's it's hard thing to do to just be put back in safety. So you you string together a couple of these games that are not you know, liking to the fans or, you know, making tackles, you got to put a safety in there. And that's like Kayvon Wallace. And now do you pay this guy Gardner Johnson or you put him at nickel? So that's the situation that I'm looking at from a distance and if it's brewing or not. Sure, sure. Also, important to remember that Jordan Davis will not be the first Eagles defensive tackle or NFL defensive tackle to not play a whole lot in his season debut. In fact, um, Broderick Bunkley, we mentioned before, uh -huh. 14th overall pick in 2006, he didn't even start a game until his second year in the league. Wow. Uh, Dexter Lawrence, the really big 330 pounder for the Giants. He played 28 snaps last year in his first game. Vita Vea for the Buccaneers, 33 snaps. So as you can see, the big guys especially, they don't always play a whole lot of reps in their first NFL game. But that's this new age NFL. Man. Rotation. Back in my day, if you were the first round pick, you started right away, right out right. the gate. All right, by the way, best Broderick Bunkley story, go. Man. I just love his, his, his phrase. He said, whenever, whenever something was funny, he would say, Mickey Mouse. Yeah. <laughs> what would he say? Mickey Mouse. Mickey, Mickey Mouse? Mouse. Yeah, like oh, he's from Florida. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I have Florida State guys, Trey, yeah. so I'm yeah. sure you had some respect for him, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of respect for him. He was yeah. a weird dude. Funny dude. <laughs> weird yeah. dude. Funny dude. Good dude. Good dude. <laughs> 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 all right. That's all right. <laughs> We're going to move away from class. the trenches yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're going to talk about the quarterbacks, because obviously this game features two very good quarterbacks of very different styles and different pedigrees. Jalen Hurts is the epicenter of the Eagles offense. It runs based on him and what he does. Last week, 242 passing yards, 90 more rushing yards on 17 carries, and a touchdown. Folks, that's 332 yards of total offense and 49 times that the ball was in his hand where he's doing something. Obviously, what we saw, fellas, was a very RPO-centric offense. Mm -hmm. You saw runs from the quarterback, runs from the running back, and you saw a, a quick, short, intermediate passing game built off the RPOs. Uh, before we get into the 17 runs, because I know that we all have strong opinions about that, I want to ask you this, Jay. Is this the right offense for this team, for this quarterback right now? I think it is for sure. Now, I think that his, his completion percentage has to go up, but he did a great job protecting the football with the number of blitzes that was thrown his way. Yes. Without the hot read, he had a few opportunities. I think it was three times that I counted that he did have an outlet, mm -hmm. but he looked down at the blitz rather than getting it out, right? He looked to run rather than just getting the ball out faster, right? right? But that's an improvement from, you know, last year when every time the blitz came, he looked and let me get out of here, you know? Mm -hmm. You can't anticipate the rush. You got to figure out a way to get the ball out of your hand. So and um, so yeah. so, but I was very impressed with him protecting the football. Definitely. Again, completion percentage has to has to get higher. And when the first option is not there, it still remains to be seen what he's going to do because AJ Brown is a guy that can win those one-on-one -on -one matchups 90% of the time. Sure. So he doesn't. He may not have to go to number two, but when he does have to go to number two, will he be ready to do that? that still remains to be seen. So, so let's get to that other topic that you brought up then. Blitzes, hot routes, receivers making side adjustments. You and I spoke about a certain play, a third and five. In first, first or second drive was an RPO. And oh, yeah. There yeah. were really only two options, which was a Dallas Goddard screen on the left side and then a fade by Devontae uh, Smith on the right side yeah. against a seven-man pressure, I believe it was. 
they, and they, they dropped them off late. Yeah. yeah. So, so Trey also brought up uh, before the show, showed me on, on the film there, there was a play where there's a blitz coming, another six or seven man rush, and all the, as he said, the receivers are doing cardio, meaning they're all running around. <laughs> Nobody stops and turns to the quarterback and says, I'm here against this blitz, save me. Uh, I'm here to save you. Is that on the coaches and the way they're designing the offense? Is that on the quarterback, the receiver? That's, that's usually a, it's a built-in play, right? So any hot read is usually like something that's taught with the coaching staff, and you know it based on the blitz, based on the nickel, whatever it is that the scheme calls for. If they're in a play that doesn't have that, that's on the coaching. Now, there was a time, so I don't necessarily know 100%, because when you talk about that third and five, that was Devontae Smith not being aware that I'm getting the ball and I'm blocking. Right. So that could be either or. It could be a receiver that's not knowing the play. He's working with new guys, you know, especially um, A.J. Brown and then Quez. They're still younger, mm -hmm. and maybe they didn't pick up the call, but majority of the time it's the, up to the offensive coordinator to either allow the quarterback to change the play mm -hmm. and or to have it built in. And I know that he didn't change the play. No. So if it wasn't built in, it's one or two reasons. Mm. It wasn't coach or the receiver didn't do it. What do you make of that, Trey? To me, uh, that's a lot. You know, uh, yeah. because first of all, I think every coach is going out there and saying, all right, you know what, look, if you, because if, if, if we're out there and you're to my left and, and, you know, and you see that nickel starting to creep, what's your call? You're going to call Cowboy. You're going to yeah. let me know that, hey, something's coming. And then now if he's coming, that means I got to pick him up. We're going to slide to him. And then now nine times out of ten, he's going to run some type of hot route, especially if that safety is playing so far off. Yeah. The safety in the corner is playing so far off. You're going to get a, a, a little hot route, something to give him some help because that you have an extra blitzer coming. See, this is, this is younger players versus veterans. Even if it isn't called, if I know that, I'm, if, that, that Donovan or Mike or whoever else is getting pressure, that 12 yard route just turned into seven for me. Yeah. Right, that's, that's a veteran thing to do. You're dealing with a bunch of young guys, so you have to like know this and have the coaching baby it, like spoon feed it to them so they know it and, and, and you call it rather than yeah. them pick it up. Cause Quez is out there just running. I'm running! Yeah. There's so much grass out here, I'm just running. <laughs> right, yeah. right. So for what Trey's talking about, on that specific play you pointed out, heavy blitz coming, He's the slot receiver. All he has to do is turn around and be like, I'm hey, here. I'm here. Yeah. And Boom. he's running all the way up the field. Man, he ran I, a 30 I, yard I, route. Yeah. So <laughs> in, in that situation, even even though I don't have a hot read, I peek. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, and that's just veteran, right? Yeah. So that that's it. So so if you don't have veterans out there, which you don't, you as the quarterback and the offensive coordinator has to have it built in. You can't depend on them knowing it or not. Right. Right. Adam, you, you and I talked about this. So that would be coaching more so than players that, in that moment. This is what Adam and I talked about. If you know that your quarterback is going to have to run 17 times or they're coming at you, can't you take some pressure off him? Go a little every once in a while. I know it's not the big thing to do in the NFL anymore, but they did it last year against the Lions and started to rewrite themselves, which is go under center, get your big offensive line going forward, let your quarterback turn around, hand the ball off to a running back, and that, for a couple of plays, that takes the pressure off your QB it did. to be the offense. Was it the Raider game? It was the Raider game okay. to start with. Yeah. Then they got clocked, you know. And then the next week they did it they against ran the well. Lions. And and they ran it well. It actually settled things down. That's why we said to do it. We asked Greg that. Cosell actually said, Abs they have to do this. Right. And we were all happy with it. And it's, it, look, I don't know if they lead the NFL in rushing without doing it. Right. By the way, the Lions did that last week. They did go under center on several snaps yeah. and just say, we're bigger. We're, we're big and strong, and we'll go up right against you. I have something to say about that. This game is not a game that I can point to and say Jalen Hurts should have just thrown the ball. I can't. I I, like, it's only yeah. two or three times where I thought that he could have got the ball out of his hands. A lot of these plays needed to be made. He made them, right? They are following in coverage. They blitzed and they played man to man behind it. One of your best options as a quarterback that can run is to make them pay and gain 20 yards from it. Right. 20, 30 yards on a third and 15 or whatever it may be. Uh -huh. 
Uh -huh. Like that's something that you should do as a quarterback. Look, Even Tom Brady will take off for seven, eight yard if they're in twenty-two. Oh, I, I would never want to you know, take away his. Yeah, money yeah. Take care of his I'm just t trying to say. Yeah. The dude got hit. The dude had carried the ball seventeen times. I don't think anybody thinks. No, that's we a don't. Long-term recipe yeah, for success. No, I agree with that. Right. What I'm saying is, is that the game kind of dictated this. Dictated yeah, this to some after. to right. some point to some extent. Right. I think that he could have got it out a few times, but a lot of these times he needed to run. And I think what's Absolutely. going to be the change up is that defenses are going to start mush rushing him. Where they don't, they kind of just keep their lanes, they just run upfield and keep their lanes, yep. and they force them to stay in the pocket. Right. So the mush rush As is. As an alternative to a huge blitz, by yes. the way. Right? Yes. Yeah. The mush rush is what the Falcons used against Vic in the championship game. They, uh, actually, no, I'm sorry, the Eagles did. Eagles the against, yeah. Where you, you're, you're there, you're playing or. Following them in, you're not gonna you're not gonna get beat by the quarterback. Yeah. And I gotta say something about Hertz. I've never seen him run this well. Like he had acceleration. I don't know if it was the, the grass. We never when we've talked about Hertz on our show, we've never talked about him being explosive. Like I've never seen him run that fast. It was incredible. Maybe it's the carpet. And Dan Campbell said that. He goes, We just couldn't get him. Well, they don't they, so so the 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 solution for Jalen Hurts is gonna be linebackers that can actually run is playing coverage, not necessarily blitzing and playing man like Aaron Glenn did, mm -hmm. but the solution for him is to play coverage, right? Confuse him with coverage and looks. You blitz him and have those, um, those linebackers that can run, right? To, to, to can just, run. Yeah, yes, can run. those guys, when you, when you have guys that can run and you can play coverage behind it, that bothers him more than just man-to-man -man blitzes. Former Eagle Jordan Hicks also on the team who, who can blitz and can well, cover. Well, he, he had 14 tackles this past year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, we are going to take a quick break to hear from our friends at Sky Motor Cars and the voice of the Eagles, that's Mr. Merrill Reese. Motor Cars in Westchester is a different sort of dealership. All it takes is one look at their Highline pre-owned vehicles that people over the country want to see. Owner Brett Schiller, make sure you don't spend a dime of your money before you purchase the car. Sky Motor Cars allows you to make all the decisions regarding your next vehicle. At Sky Motor Cars, you never have to spend more than necessary. Visit SkyMotorCars.com today or call 610-918-7225. All right, if you stop into Sky Motor Cars out there in Westchester, PA, make sure you tell them Adam and Jeff sent you. You'll get a great deal. And of course, you can visit them at SkyMotorCars.com. Uh, as we get back to quarterbacks, fellas, the guy on the other sideline, Tonight, Kirk Cousins, um, def totally a different skill set. Uh, good thrower of the football, often knocked for just being one and two in his three playoff appearances, despite having uh, the first, I believe, all guaranteed contract for a quarterback when the Vikings signed him years ago. But if you look at how he compares to uh, some of the other quarterbacks in the league, fifth and since, since 2015, when he became a starter, fifth in passer rating, fourth in passing touchdowns, third in passing yards, second in completion percentage, I mean, he's up there with guys like Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady. He, he's there with them statistically, but he's only one game over 500, and so everybody kind of uses that as a reason to knock him. I say news alert, he's pretty good, and he's been good against the Eagles. I think he's solid. I mean, you know, and then you, you, you get him out there, he has a really good offensive line in front of him right now. Yeah. You know, uh, you have a run game, and then you have some weapons out there that he could throw the ball to. I mean, you know. So that makes it a whole lot better for you, especially with this offensive line that he has. Right now, I think that the right guard that they have over there for Minnesota mm -hmm. is kind of the one that you would want to attack a little bit. But I think all in all, this is a pretty good offensive line that we're going to be going up against. Why don't people like Kirk Cousins? I don't know why they don't like him. I know receivers love to play for him. Like, yeah. you know, because these guys get the ball. And he's going to get it to the open guy, and he's going to get it at a high rate, right? He's 70% 70, um, 70, 70 this past game, 71% yeah. completion percentage. That's a pretty good thing that you have going there. And the thing that you knock Kirk Cousins is for is maybe sometimes in winning moments. But you have to also, you know, put it in perspective, the Vikings defense hadn't been the greatest defense in the world, right? right. So right. when you put it all together, you want him to win some of those games, but even Aaron Rodgers and how great he has been throughout the history, has won championship because they had, they didn't address defense. Right. So it's kind of hard to win games if you don't have defense. Yeah, a couple things here with, with uh, Cousins. He's super aggressive. Mm -hmm. He'll make every single throw that you want him to make. He's, he's tough, he's durable. He's a solid quarterback. The one annoying thing that he does is, and it's not good. He throws a lot on third down short of sticks. 
I don't know why he does this. Everyone who's coached him has mentioned it to me. Really? There's something with him about, okay, it's third and six. I'm going to throw it to you and then go get the first down. No, throw it past the line. I don't know why he does that. And it's just really odd. I don't know if there's a stat for this. I call that uh, Sam Bradforditis. Uh, it's kind of weird. I don't know. I don't know. Like so. So He's done that, it a lot. I, I need to look at that and see. I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Go ahead. I, I'll give you some feedback <laughs> that later Three on in the season, right? Yeah, yeah, because. If the route is at eight yards and he's throwing it at six yards, five yards, that's just weird. I, I well, would have maybe to see. he means like he dumps it off to the, the or, flat, or, or, or yeah, maybe yeah. maybe he isn't like looking behind the the, the yard mark because there's sort of always the an over, yeah o- over and under. Like he won't right. take the one behind; he wants the one right at the. the and right. because of the latest restructure, he will be their quarterback next year as well. There's nothing they can do to get out of the contract, so he's the guy. Kellamon, not they got rid of him. Yeah. So look. The guy gets the job done, but I think Jason hit on it. There's always been something wrong with the roster. The offensive line, they've addressed it. The secondary, they, they brought in Andrew Booth, Lewis yeah. Seen. So over time, they'll probably win more games. All right, let's get back to what we were talking about with Jonathan Gannon, who is, you know, under the gun this week. I mean, after last week, oh everybody's looking about what he does against this A, running game with Dalvin Cook, and then B, the passing game, of course, with Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen. And by the way, uh, ever since Justin Jefferson got drafted, Kirk Cousins, to your point on how receivers like him, his passer rating has gone from 101, which is really good, to 104. So clearly, the addition of Justin Jefferson has made a huge difference. So, Jay, if you are our Jonathan Gannon tonight, um, what are you doing? Forget, we, we already know up front they've got to stop the run and be better, but if you're trying to confuse Kirk Cousins, because that's what Jonathan Gannon says he's about, what are you doing to confuse him? You can't, like, I don't, I don't necessarily know if you're going to confuse veteran quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. It's very, very hard to confuse them unless you do something that's totally out of ordinary for your defensive scheme, right? The only way that you can give like confusion to the sense that I think that he's talking about mm-hmm. is to blitz and throw off timing. Right. Like throwing off timing for for a defensive back buys you so much time as a as a D lineman. That's the way you win, like when when you when it break when football breaks down. It's always blocking, tackling, and can we cover these people man-to-man and can you get open? It, it, it comes down to the same thing. The people that can play man-to-man coverage mm-hmm. in critical moments and be able to blitz and get home, those teams throw off timing. It's nothing new. It's the same thing Dick LeBeau did. It's the same thing Jim Johnson did. It's, they throw off timing. Right. His, right. Oh, I was going to say, his chemistry with Thielen and, and Jefferson is remarkable. Yeah. I mean, they, if they protect... They get protection tonight. We're going to see how good these corners and Chauncey Gardner Johnson is. Trey, if they don't blitz a lot, because you know John again, I'm not going to wake up and all of a sudden decide I'm going to blitz 25 times tonight. How about some games up front? Like we, I don't, I thought we would see more of that from this defensive line. Some twists, some stunting, some but overloads. If you run games, you have to. If you run games, especially against offensive tackles that everybody vertical sets, it makes it a lot easier to switch off. So games aren't as effective as a lot of people think, just especially if you're in the wrong stance. Okay. Because anytime you stutter step as an offensive lineman, I'm taught to stop right. because I know something's coming. Right. You know. So if I see that you don't have the right foot back and you start to stutter step, then it makes it a lot easier for to switch it off. But I'm like with you, Jason. I mean, you're gonna have to get in there and you're gonna have to throw these receivers off. You're gonna have to press. You got big money guys out there. Let's get out there and let's press. Ooh, I love that. You know, let's press because you got to give this defensive front time to get there. If you just sit up there and you let Kirk Cousins sit out here and just get rid of the ball and everything's under 2.1 seconds, we're gonna have a long day. I, I feel like you're probably conflicted because I know last year you took a deep dive into the Eagles' pass rush problems. You did it on the inside of the burst platform inside the tape with Trey. You can go back and find it on the Inside the Birds platform. And what you found, if I'm paraphrasing correctly, if I remember, is that as much as the, the defensive line got knocked for not getting to the quarterback, it's because the quarterbacks had just all day to pick apart the, yeah. the all the off coverage. Like, they only were holding on to the ball for a second and a half to two yeah. seconds. Like, I, like I, I, when I, I sit down and I watch the game, and this is why I don't watch the game with a lot of people, because I sit there with two <laughs> color pens, and you can see my notes here. I pull up my notes here so that you guys can see my notes. I thought it was just I record like us. 
everything. So like I sit there with a, a stopwatch. Uh -huh. And it's crazy, it's weird. You know, my wife doesn't even, you know, she went, yeah. I'm like, I'm sitting there with a stopwatch, <laughs> but I got different color pins and I time every throw. Uh -huh. And so when I sit there and I say, okay, quarterbacks is getting rid of the ball, 1.6, 1.5, 2.2, I mean, 1.9. I mean, come on, there's no quarterback, you know, no rush is getting there. Most sacks happen at 2.2, 2.3 seconds. Right. Most sacks happen around that time frame. For you to get a sack, and 1.8, that means that no one blocked you at all. Yeah. So when you're allowing this to happen, that's a problem. You're going to have to get up there and press. How, how, how big is tonight's game for Cannon, Adam? Well, look, the pressure stuff, Sirianni continues to protect. He says it's not an issue, okay? You know, it's, it's more, you know, it's the outside talks. Talk radio, us here. But the fact of the matter is they've spent so much money on defense. Five new starters on each level of the defense. At minimum, of, we mm -hmm. may see more change. Right. Who knows? We may see more changes. And the draft looks really good. The Kobe Dean is a backup, but eventually will be a starter. There are no more excuses. I get it. We all see this. This is a really tough matchup. But you can't use that as an excuse. And, and the guys are saying we, we agree on all. I think we all four agree. What are you going to do as a changeup? What you did last week will not work. These guys are better. No offense to DJ Chark we've always liked. He's not the player he once was. And Josh Reynolds. And Amon Ross St. Brown is a nice player. These are big time NFL. Justin Jefferson might be the NFL's best receiver. Right. Thielen, one of the best possession receivers in the National Football League. That, that's not going to work. Right. What are you doing to throw off their timing? What? So, Jason, let me ask you a question as a receiver. We just mentioned press coverage. What does press coverage do to you as a receiver? Well, it makes you uncomfortable, one, because most of the time in this new NFL, like a lot of times, you, you, guys are not built coming from college, they're not built to be able to do hand-to-hand -hand combat. And that's what press coverage is. It makes you uncomfortable because when you're running routes on there, you're going up, you're looking good, and your shorts, you turn around, the ball is there. And no, you have to like do math in your head now. When a guy is pressing you at the line of scrimmage, he's taking seconds off of the top, right? So it's automatically thrown off the time. So if I'm used to getting up to 12 yards, now it's press coverage, that turns into 10 yards. And a lot of guys don't do math that well. When it comes to, I'm just saying, like, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to, you know, press coverage. I'm one of those, but I don't you know, and, 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 and so it messes up a lot of things. Now, Justin Jefferson, Adam Thielen, two of the best at press coverage. So you have to have some type of game plan. But one thing that you don't see a lot from corners, everyone's scared to be up there because they, they're known to be good at press. Right. So just throw off the timing as far as doing something unique. And this is why I love Asante Samuel, even in press. Asante would sometimes fake the quick jam, back up, fake the quick jam, back up and give you the, give it to you at five yards, right? Quick jam right, right at five yards. Right. Like you have to throw off timing. Same way with a defensive lineman, him talking about feet, or offensive lineman shooting hands and jumping and all those things. You have to be in tune with the game. And, and, and when you're playing press coverage that's, as, as that's a That's the part of the game that's, that's up here. That's the part of it. You can't just yeah. do the same thing over and over again. Yeah. Once the receiver gets your time, and it's done. Uh, it's, that's interesting. Now, how many steps would it take for you to run a 10-yard route? Five, five steps, four to five steps. So when you got pressed in, it turns into what? It'll, that 10 yard route will turn into about eight, eight route, eight. But it, it all depends on how fast I can get my release. So I, I always say I'm balling on a budget. If I spend time <laughs> at the line of scrimmage, I don't have time to buy anything at the top. So I right. got to go in fast. Right. If I get free release at the bottom, I have all the t money in the world to shake somebody in and make them think something else at the top. Right. So you only have a limited amount of time. And that's right. what makes it hard for a receiver. Do you prefer man or zone? I prefer man because I wasn't fast to be able to do a bunch of other stuff. And that was, that's why I shine the most in man to man. So it made my value go up because in critical situations and in man coverage, anybody can get open in zone once you recognize the defense, right? But in man to man, you have to beat somebody. You have to be strong. I relish when per, a person would be in front of me. I want to make them look stupid to let everybody in the league know just because he run a 4-6 doesn't mean he can't play for a long time. Did you ever make anyone look stiff? <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Four, Let me, six, off that, were there guys over the years where you felt, man, I just got this guy badly in man? In, what, what in, in man, thing? in man. Any corners you said you made stupid in, in man? Oh, I got, I got a lot of them. You know, it was, <laughs> yeah, I, got, I got a lot of them. It's only an hour left in the show, Adam. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I've gotten a lot of them. I, I've made Charles Woodson fall down. I've made yeah. Darrell Reeves st Ow. stumble. Like, Push ball. just technique. No, yeah. no pushing. Yeah. Just making them think I'm doing something else. Oh, you beat him with moves. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so let's close the book here on Jonathan Gannon for this show so far. What we know is this. Ownership like this man. 
even before they hired Nick Sirianni. We knew Jeffrey Lurie knew about Jonathan Gannon as he was coming up the ranks first through Minnesota and then through Indianapolis, and that was a big draw when he hired Nick Sirianni knowing Jonathan Gannon was going to be here. We also know they had high expectations for him that were not met last year. It was a disappointing year. As Adam mentioned, they went out, and the most, th they did, most things they did this offseason were geared toward making life better for Jonathan Gannon to want to do what he's going to do. He's had one test so far. It did not go very well. They won the game. It didn't go very well. And by the way, Vic Fangio has been hanging out at the Eagles' uh, training camp practices all summer, and I even heard he was at practice again this week. But the bottom line is, for Jonathan Gannon, he's going to have to show results, and it's going to have to be somewhat soon because any more you know, 30, 30 points, one week, two weeks, three weeks, then he's going to really feel the, the, the hot seat. The only thing, and I'm, I've, I've, been a very, I've been a criticizer of Gannon pretty much since he got the job. I'm not going to run away from it. Uh -huh. But they have so many new players. I, if this is going on in midseason, they're going to have a major problem. But you got to give the guy time. I, I get it in this town. Yeah, it's just week one. I get it. Just week one. We, we want immediate results. It doesn't happen that way. You can't just go like that. Right. But this can't continue two more months. Th that's, that's what I was getting. It can't be week after week. Yeah. Right. Week one, as you said, you never know. what, what Week two could be totally different. But obviously tonight, all eyes will be on Jonathan Gannon. All right, we're going to take a split-second break to hear from our friends at Rivers Casino and Sportsbook. Game night for me is every night. At the place where I meet up with the guys, grab a cold one, and watch the big game on the big screen. So whether it's the money line, the pass line, or parlay, I'm in it to win. This is my city, and this is my place. All right, thanks to our friends at River Sportsbook and Casino. We're here at Jack's Bar in tonight, but we did catch up with Greg, and he had some very interesting things to say about Jalen Hurts, some of the defensive struggles, and, of course, the Vikings' offensive line he thinks is a little bit better than maybe it's getting credit for. So let us head to Cosell's Corner. We're here with the tape breakdown guru, Greg Cosell, for this Week 2 Monday night matchup between the Eagles and the Minnesota Vikings. Greg, a lot to talk about. A lot of people want to talk about the Eagles' run defense breakdowns, but they weren't so good in pass defense as well against the Detroit Lions. Uh, they were not particularly good on third down, nor rushing the passer. Often those go hand-in-hand. Hand. What did you see? You know, that's a fascinating question, Jeff, for this reason, because they didn't give up many passing yards. So, you know, again, what is the measure? And there's many ways to measure this, but – in a game in which the the opponent was behind most of the game, you know, once we got through the first quarter, in a, in a game in which the opponent was behind most of the first quarter, most of the game, and had to throw the football, the Eagles did not give up many passing yards. So I guess my question would be, what is the measure by which we're saying that the Eagles' pass defense was not very good? Well, I would say by the third down Although I do know that the Lions did have some longer runs on third down. But in the second half, uh, you saw Jared Goff sort of have time in the pocket there to be able to find some of his weapons on some key, whether it was Hawkinson or Chark or even St. Brown on yeah, some key I mean, plays there in the second half. So I would say that what the tape showed was that the Eagles struggled to rush the passer. Um, and that was, I thought, a, a significant part of this game. Um, obviously, they do not want to be a high percentage blitzing team. They had some selective blitzes here and there, which even teams that are not heavy blitz teams will do. But this is not a heavy blitz team. That's not their MO. So they rely on either four or five-man pressures are, are often categorized as blitz. But w the way the Eagles do it, I wouldn't really call it a blitz because it's really five on the line of scrimmage. They're five mm -hmm. on-the-ball defenders. Like, for instance, uh, one big play in the game, which I believe came in the third quarter, if memory serves me correctly, was Reynolds for 28 yards on third down. I don't know if you remember that specific play. I do. And it was a big play at the time. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think that that play, they rushed five, and they ended up in the secondary playing what we call three under three deep. It's a zone concept. But if you're going to rush five and play a zone concept behind it, you're down a body. So right. there are more voids. Now, you are you are relying on your pass rush when you rush five and get one-on-one -on -one matchups with the offensive line. 
you're counting on that to speed up the quarterback. That was a throw down the field, as you recall. It was basically a high-low concept, and he ran, Reynolds ran a corner route. So that's mm-hmm. a throw that takes time, route that takes time, and they did not get to the quarterback. Then I remember there was another really well-designed misdirection screen to Swift. You probably mm-hmm. remember that play as well. But overall, what the tape showed is they struggled to rush the quarterback, and I think that's not something we figured going into the season would, would be a, pr- a problem. And certainly it's one game, so we're not suggesting that that's a weakness. But it was they were not able to do that with any kind of efficiency or consistency week one. Right. And to your point, I think, you know, obviously that was an issue last year. They added Hassan Reddick, Brandon Graham yep. is back from the AC, uh, from the Achilles injury. You have Javon Hargrave, you have Fletcher Cox, and of course, Josh Sweat. So that really is not supposed to be an issue Correct. going forward for the Eagles. But like you said, just one week, we'll have to see how uh, Jonathan Gannon gets that crew ready to go against the Vikings, who Greg By have a way, lot. Go ahead. I personally think. Um, that the Vikings have a very good old line. I think it's they've invested a lot into it. Um, they have high draft picks playing. I think they're starting a rookie at right guard who whose tape I really liked, Ed Ingram, coming out of LSU. So they have two second-round picks at guard in Ingram and Cleveland. They have Darisaw at left tackle, who's a first-round pick, who's going to be a very good player. They've got a solid right tackle uh, in um, O'Neal. You could almost argue that the weakness, and he's not a weakness, is the center Bradbury. But I think it's a solid O-line. Um, so this is not going to be necessarily an easy challenge. What do you think Jonathan Gannon will have to do, given what you just said about the offensive line and what most people know about the Vikings' perimeter weaponry and even their running back, Dalvin Cook, but specifically in the Vikings' passing game, what kind of adjustments would you look for? What do you think the Eagles have to do to make sure that the Vikings don't come out of there with four passing touchdowns. Well, you know, there's a little bit of a change in philosophy in the league and certainly in the Vic Fangio school of thought with Jonathan Gannon is, is obviously leaning toward, I mean, that's kind of where he's going. And the philosophy is this, the philosophy, and and it's, it's debatable, reasonable people can disagree with this, Jeff, Mm -hmm. that you're the, the priority defensively should be to stop the pass now, not the run, because the big explosive plays percentage-wise in the NFL come out of the passing game. And you're trying to prevent big explosive plays. Now, I know fans listening to this will say, oh, well, that's great. Last year you had quarterbacks completing 75, 80, 85% against the Eagles, but yet they didn't give up big explosive plays. Now, again, like I said, you can debate this. So the question becomes, with a team that has a good old line and a really high level running back, Dalvin Cook is a big, big time back. What is your approach? Now, it's not one or the other. Nothing is ever 100% one way or the other. But, you know, if you're, let's say you decide you're going to play your 5 2 front against the, the Vikings, okay? If they line up in base. And by the way, they're going to line up in less base than we might be used to because Kevin O'Connell coming from the Rams lines up far more in 11 personnel. But the point is, as I mentioned on that Reynolds 28-yard completion, if you want to, let's say, rush five, you have fewer people in coverage. And now you're dealing with Jefferson, who we know about, and you're dealing with Thielen, who's very good. And, you know, don't forget it was a few years ago before Jefferson got there that it it seemed like Thielen every week was getting nine for 130. So. You know, and and I actually really like K.J. Osborne. He is a very good number three. So, you know, you have to decide what your approach will be. Now, this is a team that normally does not play a lot of man-to-man, the Eagles. Pure Mm -hmm. man, where they just line up and say, you know, the so-called cat defense, you got that cat. Every zone concept has man principles, and the Vic Fangio defense does. So when you play Jefferson now, who lined up both outside and in the slot last week. Thielen will line up outside and in the slot. You have to have principles that account for their routes. I mean, we saw Jefferson last week run free in a Packers secondary because they had a lot of busts. So if you're going to play zone with match principles, then you have to, what they call in in that scheme, the Fangio group calls it match, carry, deliver. You've got to match, carry him to a certain point, and then deliver him to someone, not deliver him to avoid, deliver him to another defender. 
You know, right. now, will there be snaps in which Darius Slay matches up man to man on Jefferson? Yes, I believe there will be, but they're not going to match him up on 70 snaps. Uh, because that's not the way the Eagles play defense, as you know. Right. Right. All right. Big challenge. Wait, it's the Eagles defense. Let's talk on the other side of the, the football. Jalen Hurts. Uh, the RPO offense that you saw against the Detroit Lions. Yeah. Give me your observations in general on his performance and the offense. Hertz played a really solid game. I thought the O-line had some issues. He had to bail them out at times, which he's more than capable of doing with his running ability, particularly on critical downs, money downs, third down. Um, he threw the ball well. Um, Jalen might be one of those quarterbacks. He's not the only one. I see it all the time on tape with certain guys. He might be a guy that always misses a few. You know, there's there's a bunch of guys like that in the league. Um, you know, the, the kind, well, he'd like to have back, I, you know, he threw one in the flat and they might've scored on the same, on the drive after, but he threw one in the flat in the red zone, you know, at, at the knees of, uh, at the feet of, I forget who it was, but Kenneth you know, he, he, may, he may be that guy, but he mm -hmm. also made some phenomenal throws. I mean, the, the, uh, fade ball to Brown when he, against the backup corner wall, Harris, you couldn't have handed it to Brown any better. So, and the running ability, you know, the, the, the great thing about Jalen Hurts is, you know, we may never speak about him as if he's Drew Brees, and that's fine because there's all different kinds of quarterbacks and there's all that can play different ways. But the running ability is a big element to his game, and he doesn't turn the ball over, Jeff. And that's a big factor because, Huge. you know, that's – you know a lot of coaches believe that that's what wins and loses games. You, you turn the ball over, you lose games. So, you know, that's – we'll see. I mean, there's – look, obviously the Eagles feel the same way. They're going to see this year how he does over the course of a long season. He played well week one in a game that, you know, he – well, every game you want your quarterback to play well, but in a game in which I should say the O-line was not at its best. Gotcha. Um, the Lions clearly came after him with several pressures clearly. from all sorts of angles. How will the Vikings, in your mind – I know it's just one week of tape – but what will they try to do to rattle Jalen Hurts in the offense? Well, I thought the Vikings defense was one of the most fascinating watches of the week for me. Um, the Vikings defense under Ed Donatel, again, another Vic Fangio disciple to a large extent. <clears throat> they were very multiple up front. A lot of different front looks. Different from the, what the Lions did, but very multiple. And they've got three guys who are long and athletic in Daniil Hunter, in Zadarius Smith, and DJ Wonham. I mean, these guys are athletes and they're long. And then in the secondary, they literally sat before the snap almost on every play in a quarters structure, four across. They hardly played any man. Now, that four across did not stay that way after the snap. There was a lot of movement uh, going to different things, and they will do that. They will do that to try to slow down the decision-making for Jalen. And then the big issue becomes if Jalen feels he's not getting a clear picture because he knows he can run, how do you then handle the fact that he is going to pull the ball down and run? Because, the you know, the Lions didn't handle it very well, quite honestly. Um, so the Vikings, you've got to handle that because Jalen will do that. And look, you and I both know, we've discussed this, that, mm -hmm. and this is what the tape always shows. There are times he runs theoretically when he doesn't have to, but because he's very good at it, he can still make something positive happen. The concern comes about in any given game when maybe he does that and he doesn't make, you know, first down runs. And mm -hmm. then we talk about the throws that were there in which he didn't turn it loose. Of course, of course. And then, of course, the rising hit toll as the season goes on Correct. every time that he and, and he's a sturdy guy, but, you know, it's still, you know, you worry about that in this league. I mean, defensive sure. players are getting faster. They're bigger. At some point, you know, if, even if he's not hurt, hurt where he has to, let's say, miss a game, mm -hmm. is it just the war of attrition where, you know, last year he hurt the ankle and there was a stretch of maybe, what, three or four games where he, he clearly couldn't run the same way. Right. All right. It's judgment time, Mr. Cosell. Ah! Who wins the game, <laughs> Professor? You know, it's the home opener. I mean, obviously the fans will be great, you know, but this is a really good Vikings team, I, you know. I, I think this will be a really good game. You know, um, my heart obviously says Eagles, but I, I kind of like the Vikings in this game. I think offensively they present a lot of issues for, for a defense. Um, so I'm going to pick the Vikings. I guess I need to pick a score, huh? That always um, helps. Yeah. Let's go 31-28. I think this is going to be a great game. It could go either way. And believe it or not, the player of the game, I'm actually – 
going to pick Adam Thielen. Because I think, look, you play the Vikings, you're going to have to focus on Jefferson, no question. And Mm -hmm. and I think the Eagles will do that. But Adam Thielen is a really good player. And I think that he's going to be a guy that is going to come out in this game. And, you know, it's great to walk away from this game saying we held Jefferson to five for 72. But if Adam Thielen gets nine for 150, you know, that's not so good either. And I think I, I'm not saying he's going to get that, Jeff, but I think this game could trend a little more in that direction. All right. Well, that's why you are the tape breakdown master, and I know that you'll be back with us next Sunday night uh, or Sunday afternoon to break yep. down that Washington game uh, week three. Thanks for having us. Uh, thanks for joining us, Greg. We'll uh, see you soon. Thanks, Jeff. Always great to hear from the tape breakdown master, Greg Cosell. A lot of good thoughts on the Vikings and the Eagles. And, of course, Greg will be back with us for our next pregame show on Sunday for Eagles Washington. Uh, some interesting things there from Greg Cosell, Adam, especially on the Vikings offensive line. It used to be that people would say, if you're going to beat the Vikings, you got to attack their offensive line. It's not very good, but apparently Greg sees it differently. What do you see there? Yeah, so the guy that you look at and say this guy could be a stud left tackle, which they have not had in I don't know how long, is Christian Darisol. Now, he missed seven games last year due to uh, groin surgery, but he's healthy now. Brian O'Neill has been a great story, former 10 in pit. Then moved late in his career to left tackle. He's playing right tackle, which is new to him, mm-hmm. uh, but he is the right tackle. He got an extension. He's good. But you got two young players, Ezra Cleveland, who's a, who's a second-year starter, third-year player uh, out of Boise, I believe, and Ed Ingram, who's a, who's a rookie, who uh, Greg was talking about. And Garrett Bradbury is a lighter guy, Former first round pick has never been good enough. And as one guy that played in the league told me, he said, who played on offense, he goes, You always worry about when a young offensive line is playing together for the first time, mm-hmm. especially in a loud crowd like the link. Communication Trey could talk mm-hmm. about this. You're worried about false starts. And boy, did the Eagles last week in Detroit have delay of games. Sure. Because you can't hear it. And so, so, Trey, here's my question to you What is that communication like? What do you, what do you say? Like, the silent count, obviously. How yeah. does this work? Well, it's going to be silent count, so it's usually going off that center's helmet. Um, but then you have other ways of doing it. Sometimes the guard, you'll see where guards reach their hand out to let the center know, all right, we're ready to go, and then he starts with his head movement. But a lot of times what we would do, we would come up with hand signals. So if I had to talk, if Todd had to make a call for me, if we had a duel, Todd would shake his hand like this, all right, duel, 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 I knew it was a duel. Or if, he, if I knew it, we were sliding left, he would just fan his hand out, and I knew that, all right, I need to slide outside. So we came up with different hand signals to kind of help us out with whatever we needed to do. Did anyone ever, okay, wait, did, you just said he would do this to fan out, but wouldn't they pick that up? Well, yeah, but everybody knows what we're doing anyway. Oh, I, mean, oh. I mean, even if it's a home game and you okay. can hear us, okay. it doesn't matter. You know, everybody can hear. Defensive players sometimes get so <laughs> locked in. I mean, they don't. They, I mean, you make an L call, they like, oh, what, what does that mean? You know, <laughs> okay. it, it, it still doesn't matter. So okay, just curious. I think that, you know, if it's a side protection, you still have to come up with some hand signals or whatever to kind of help you out. And, of course, you're going to be on the silent count. Trey, our Patreon subscriber, Aaron Puga, has asked, do you think that left tackle Christian Darrisaw, who uh, Adam just mentioned, second-year player, can he handle the athleticism of Hassan Reddick and Josh Sweat, based on what you've seen? Uh, yeah, I think he can. Okay. You know, especially the way they're rushing right now, because, I mean, Josh Sweat, to me, I like the way Josh Sweat rushes when he, ha- he has a little slipperiness to him where he can give you that flash and can get underneath. Um, he has a nice inside move. My only problem with him is that he always lines up with the same foot back. So you're always going to make contact at the same point. And so when you have someone like that, they're going to just set him at a 45. Mm-hmm. And I think you'll see that these tackles, they're going to set at a 45. They're going to shut these guys down before they get going. But I think that um, even with Hassan Reddick, I think he's the type of guy, if you sit back and you just like go straight vertical set, he can be a problem. Right. But then when you set him at a 45, you shut him down before he gets going, it makes him not as effective. Would, would you, would, one thing for both of you guys, Reddick clearly did not get to the quarterback last week. Mm-hmm. How would you how would, would you line him up as a joker? What would you do with this guy? Yeah, I would roam him around a little bit more. I wouldn't just have him just stand over a tackle. I would kind of put him at that middle linebacker space yeah. and let him, you know, let you, you have to make a call. You know, you have to make sure that you know, hey, he is the known rusher. 
You know, and uh, I, I, that would be one of the ways I would do him. Don't just put him at a regular defensive end spot. Let him be the roamer. When Adam is talking about joker, a joker is a way different thing, and we don't have that in our defense as a joker, right? Usually a joker rusher like J.J. Watt has the ability to go in and out, and the defense is kind of predicated on what he does. We don't have that structural term in order to accomplish that. And you, it has to be a pretty special player to get that type of leeway. But, Troy Palomalu, different players right? on a different yeah. level. Those guys could do other things, but they had other guys next to them that could make up for it. Yeah. That structure doesn't have, we well, don't they, have that The in Vikings place. did that last week with Zedarius Smith. Right. Now he's was, a big guy, 270 pounds. But yeah. my, my issue is that because Redick is a smaller guy, barely 6'1", 240 maybe. Yeah. I know he's explosive, but I just want to see if Gannon could figure out a way to get him one one and to win. And yeah, but, go ahead. Because if you roll him around and you move him around like the Joker, sometimes you might put him on the center. Sometimes he might end up on the running back, you know, just based off of how they make their calls. So I, 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 could, I could definitely see moving him around more. But like you said, I don't think that that position really exists with this defense. Well, and, right. and, and you want to give a guy that type of responsibility that's an absolute surefire playmaker. Right, and I'm not saying that Hassan Reddick is not, but I don't necessarily know if he's going to be Micah Parsons. That's right. so dynamic that he can go that's, anywhere, anyhow. I, got I don't you. necessarily I got know you. if he has that skill set. Right, and that's the type of guy that that you put in those positions. That a guy that's going to wreak havoc on all levels. And I don't know if that's that's his skill set yet. My only issue, Jeff, is that you don't want him to be static, yeah. because it didn't work last week. What are you doing as a changeup? If it didn't work one way, what are you doing to help him win? Because they're paying him $15 million to get the quarterback, and he didn't last week. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I always thought, well, I think we said last week, right? Hassan Reddick has a great skill set. He's very, as far as being electric off the edge, and, yeah. edge and speedy off the edge. But if you were to be able to do some of the things with him that Jason is referring to and Trey is, well, then he'd have a contract like Von Miller. I mean, he, he's yeah. clearly a guy that is best functioned going forward at the quarterback. Probably moving him around a little bit, but yeah. you're not giving him like seven different responsibilities. I got a question for Trey, right? So as a receiver, if I run a three-step slant, a four-step slant, it may, you know, increase the depth that I have. But you're saying, okay, if he if he if he's outside of splits back and he's gonna make that that contact at three yards, if he puts the inside foot up, that's gonna throw off your timing yes, now? Is it gonna it be two or four? Everything. It changes everything because we were taught to count steps. So if if his inside foot is back. If I'm a vertical setting tackle, I know I need to get the three kicks. I'm going one, two, three. I know that's where we're going to make contact. Because if his inside foot is back, he's going to go upfield. His outside foot is going to hit down. And then his third step is what's attacking. Yeah. Now, if his outside foot is back, he can go one, two, or he can go one, two, three, and four. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So that changes how you're going to set as a tackle. So I, don't, I never would jump a guy if his outside foot was back because he can put that outside foot down. As soon as that outside foot hits, bam, he can take me back inside. Uh, See what I'm saying? Okay. So I would only jump him if his inside foot was back because the inside foot has to go upfield. He cannot go inside until that outside foot hits. So is that a coaching thing? Because yeah. I'm sure that most, if that's more the, the most effective you know, thing to do, why wouldn't more teams do it? Is it or is it just comfortable it's with the play? It's a coaching thing because, I mean, you have to, co like, you have to learn – for us, we learn how to count steps. Okay. Because a, a lot of guys, they're like, hey, man, watch the shoulders of the defensive man. That was the old school way of things. Right, right. Hey, if the shoulders turn at you, that's when you shoot your hands. Nah, if you wait for that, you're already late. So we learned how to count steps, and we knew how to make contact. If not, you know, and then it makes it easier, too, because like if his inside foot is back, if he doesn't make it in three, then it's four or five. And then by yes, that time, it's too late. by the quarterback. Yeah, you see yeah. what I'm saying? So. All right. Well, it'll be uh, the whole chess match between the front <laughs> seven and the offensive line is going to be fascinating to watch tonight. Let's move away. Let's talk about Jason's position a little bit. Get into the wide receivers because there's a lot of firepower on the field tonight between yes. both teams. You had A.J. Brown in his Eagles debut sparkling yep. with his 155 yards on 10 catches. And, um, you know, a lot of people don't like to hear the name around here, but Justin Jefferson was <laughs> pretty darn good last week. 184 yards, two touchdowns. By the way, that was 
number one and number two in week one in receiving was Justin Jefferson and A.J. Brown. By the way, my favorite thing to hear, oh, that's okay that we didn't take Justin Jefferson because then that forced us to go trade for A.J. Brown as if, you know, like, that, <laughs> well, it's crazy that you got A.J. Brown, but yeah, you yeah, could have yeah, maybe yeah. had Patrick Sertain in the draft last year if you had just, I mean, there's a whole lot of things that you could have done differently, but nonetheless, here's where we're at. Jason, I know you were, you were at, asked a lot this week. I, heard, I saw you on Bird Tuttle talking about uh, A.J. Brown's debut. Um, what did you think, in, like, as far as what you saw compared to what you expected? from A.J. Brown, similar to what you thought he was going to be in this offense? You know what, seeing it from the coach's film and seeing it live is two different things, right? Mm -hmm. So um, me seeing it live and watching him, because Tennessee Titans games, you know, you, when, I, when I looked at the All-22, I'm looking at the coach's film, which is a little bit different. This Everyone's slow because the camera is up so high. But when you're looking at it live, you're like, dude, this dude is extremely explosive. And the thing that I don't think that the fans or the city of Philadelphia really hones in on, those guys were afraid to press him. They were afraid, like they mm -hmm. were pressing, they, like they were in press technique, but the guy was four yards off. Right. Which is no, you, it's, it's, it's irrelevant. You shouldn't press at four yards. There's uh -huh. no such thing. Right, but he's standing strong at four yards. Unless he got yards. four yard long arms. Yeah, right, so, so A.J. Brown could literally get up to the guy and make a move. They were like scared of him. And that's something that we hadn't had here in a number of years. But the guy can beat you with quickness. He's strong. You saw him fight for football on the go route, right? Usually quarterbacks throw a, a, most of those balls out of bounds on go routes, right? Because right. he didn't have the greatest release off the line of scrimmage, but what he did was he started to fight inside immediately and got into a hand, hand fight. Now, right. my 220 and benching 400 pounds, I'm going to weigh on you, and at the, in the last minute, my hands are going to come out, right? So little things like that. I saw a fearless competitor, and it's exciting to see. So Will Harris, is who had coverage on the, on the deep ball, right? <laughs> yeah. He literally could have been put in jail for what he tried to do. He mugged, he, he grabbed his hand, he grabbed his arm, and A.J. Brown played through contact. Now, it's funny, that was one of the few times they actually had contact with him during the game. He just ran by everybody. Yeah. So here's the question, Jason. He can run. He can run. He's Especially fast. Especially people think. 4-4-9-40. Four, four, How would you, would you double him if you're the Vikings? Can I double him would if you I'm double? the Vikings? Would you double what? I guess what the Vikings, you mean first, starting first, a safety of all, first of all, like so knowing the structure of the Vikings defense, the Vikings are not a defense that are, are built to double people. Right. They now they're zone. a zone defense. They're yeah. two, three, four, right? So it's not in their scheme to kind of like double him they're unless you yeah. yeah, unless you're 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 devising something. Would you? I would try to. But again, they can't cover a man to man because Patrick Peterson, like 100 years old, first play of the game, Watson runs right by him. The other guy, Dantzler, is no better, right? So they don't have, and they got Shandon Sullivan, which we had here, and, and yeah, yeah, as the nickel, right? So they don't have guys that can cover. So you're going to play a lot of coverage. Can you double him and leave Dallas one on one? Can you double double him and leave Devonte one on one? And Miles ran for 90 yards. Like I don't think that that's a a sustainable model in order to accomplish. I mean, you got the slim rebound there still, too. Yeah, the I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, sure. you know. Yeah, you you were big on the post game, how you have to get the Slim Reaper involved. Yeah, we got to get the Slim Reaper. Look how he's dressed right now, man. He's in a peach, like, Easter outfit, like, shorts. And, and one more thing. With no belt. Yeah, no belt. If they could protect, Quez Watkins could flat out fly. Patrick Peterson got beat by Christian Watson last week. Yeah. Out of his shorts. 75 yards, just right in his hands, he drops the football. And Cam Dancer's a tall corner. 6-3, don't run very well. Right. There are plays to be made downfield here. 100%. The, isn't that really what the Eagles offense is trying to do to you, though? If you're playing a softer zone, like obviously the Lions came at him, but if you're going to play quarters, if you're going to have your safeties a little bit back, then you're opening up the door for Jalen Hurts to say the math says, I'm going to hand the ball off here, or I'm going to fake the hand off and run, and, and I'm going to make you stop my running game in your nickel or your six-man front. Yeah, they gotta, the, the Vikings have to prove that they're going to be able to stop them Right. in a six-man front, which is hard to do. It's very hard to do with this team with the offensive line that we have, especially when it comes to run blocking offensive line. They're yeah, pretty right. good at it. And the other thing with that, if they can accomplish that, which I don't think that they can, now that's a situation now where you have the two safeties back, you got a guy beating up the receivers, and now you're forcing Jalen Hurts to play a style of football that he's not built to play yet, right. which is keeping everything in front. Now I have to read the defense and make the right read every single time. It's a tough thing to do for a young quarterback, and I don't think that they're going to do that because they can't stop the run. 
and I, so I don't think that'll ever come to fruition. Sure, sure. All right, I want to get into a little bit more of that scheme and the attack. First, I want to remind everybody about our fantastic production team. We've got Public Square and Rebel Hill. Both are back. The team of James and Zach are back behind the controls, bringing Inside the Birds to you in high definition with great graphics, videos, and more. Contact Public Square Media and Rebel Hill Productions to produce your webcast, your podcast, live show, anything that you can dream of. They can make it happen. This team will bring it to life. Trust me, these guys are the best in the business. That's Zach and James. So make sure you reach out to them at Public Square Media and Rebel Hill Productions. So I've watched the Vikings play some defense. I understand what you guys are saying. It's been positive to me that you might see some, say, trap two or inverted Tampa two where you have your you know, well, you guys know what defense is, but for the, you know, your corners are going to play a little bit more back. Safeties come up a little bit. So you're eliminating the deep ball. You're trying to at least, but you're also trying to defend that RPO with some bigger safeties by having them come up a little bit. The only thing about that defense is that your front seven better get home because if those receivers get past seven, eight yards, you're in you're for done. one because you have so much space for two cornerbacks that are not used to being at a safety position playing half of the field, and it's very, very hard to do. Sure. I would love that defensive because I knew if these guys picked it up, we were going to have a big play every single time. Sure, mm. sure. All right. Well, I mean, Zadarius Smith is a pretty good. I'm surprised that he seems to move from he, went, he was with the Ravens, Yep. And he was good there. Then he was the Packers, and he was good there. And now he's with uh, the Vikings. He's usually he's good a, pass rushers. He's rushers. a power rusher, man. He yeah. is a big dude, a legit 270. Yeah. And I love the way that Ed Donatelli, the D coordinator for the Vikings, used him last week. Because, again, they're we're running similar schemes. They're they're both looking at the Fangio scheme. And I, I understand every def every defense that are similar. They're not. They don't run everything the same way. Mm -hmm. But Zedaria Smith was moving around. So I do wonder again how the Eagles will take that, and what, what will Donatel have different this week? Mm -hmm. And again, what will Jonathan Gannon have that was different from last week? Do you think the style of defense the Vikings plays will naturally lean toward Goddard and Devontae Smith being more involved? Uh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you got it, you got it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I think that Devontae Smith being involved, I think you can still get whatever you want with, out of A.J. Brown with okay. this defense, unless they're playing cover two. If they play cover two a bunch, it'll lend to the run game. Right. Um, but I think that there's, it, it makes it, that will be a Dallas Goddard game. Mm -hmm. If they're able to do the defense that they want to do, it will put a lot of pressure on the safeties and the linebackers, and I don't think that they can cover Goddard. Because that's the thing, is Goddard could be in blocking like he was last week. Yes, they played a lot of 12 personnel, right. but it doesn't mean that Jack Stull can't stay in and he can go out. Sure. Because you saw those, those tight end screens are beautiful. Goddard came with this close to scoring. Mm -hmm. I, I'm interested because Kendricks could run. I know he's smaller. And Jordan Hicks could always cover. He had the one huge year with picks. I mean, the chess matches between the coaching staff, this sure. will be fun. Yeah. When, you, when, when you're playing coverage like this, even though you try to limit A.J. Brown, but they're automatically assuming that he's going to be outside at one. Uh -huh. If you want to play a team that's in coverage and you really want to, if they say they want to go cover two, you just put A.J. Brown at the slot. And now you have slot. If A.J. Brown and Dallas Goddard, now you don't have to worry about their corners. Right. Now you have them on lesser defenders. Like, so seeds. there are so many ways to counter what they do. Yeah, I asked you earlier if you felt the RPO offense was the best offense for the Eagles to be running. You said yes, I agree with you. Yeah. We, we outlined why. I think the secondary question to that for both the, all three of you is, even though that's the best offense for the Eagles to run for their personnel, is it a sustainable offense over 17 weeks? Is it an offense that can get them to where they want to be, which is Super Bowl champions? I'll well, start that's all with you. you. Have right now, I mean, what, you, well, what are you going to switch I asked that. Uh, you you make exactly. a great point. Yeah. What, <laughs> I've tried to say that. What's the alternative? And yeah. people, but there is a faction. <laughs> yeah. no, no, listen, listen. Oh, there there is a faction down. of people uh -huh. who say, why can't they just run a conventional drop back West Coast offense with Jalen Hurts? And I've tried to explain a thousand times what his strengths are, are more suited to, and what they're not. But people think that. People who will tell me that RPO is a gimmick want them to run a more conventional offense with him. But, but I think it, it, because of his skill set and the way he can get out there and run the ball, I think the RPOs, it helps. You know, that Certainly. he can get out there and read that backside defensive end or read that backside linebacker. All right, hey, if I suck you in a little bit, bam, here comes the pass over your head. Right. All right, you know what, that defensive end comes crashing a little bit, then now you pull it and then now you all – 
scanning down the field for another 10 yards. I, I, you know, I think it plays into his skill set. Yes. And, um, uh, you know what, what uh, I don't want to do is I don't want to everybody start trying to make him something that he's not, which is just a traditional pocket pass. He's right. not that type of player. Right. Uh, my, my thing is the RPO offense allows him the ability to be able to make decisions but also run in a favorable scenario for him, right? He can run and get a wide open lane because they're sucked into the pass. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, sucked into the, the running back run. If you put him in a conventional offense, he's still going to run when the pressure bears down, but now he's running for his life instead of in a favorable running scenario. Does that make sense to you? No, that makes a lot of sense to me. I think that a West Coast quarterback is trained that way. Yes. He's been trained that way, college trained that way, right? You are built to go through progression. It's not something that has been in his wheelhouse. He's still Absolutely. learning a lot of things in, in, in a league. There's gonna be times where he's going to get to that point to be able to run a more traditional offense. But as of right now, you want the numbers in his favor and you want him throwing against less defenders. Right. And the only way you can get him to throw against less defenders is if you establish the run game, allow him to run off tackle and those types of things. Now, I don't care about it being a West Coast offense. I just need explosive plays right. and um, games being won. Right. So that means if, if we turn this into a run play action offense, I'm okay with that. There's right. been championships won right. with running the football and playing play action. Now, has it been in the last 10 years? Not so much. Right. But there's a bunch of teams that can, you know, run the ball and, and play action off of it. And I, and I think that's okay. That helps the receivers as well. Sure. Yeah. So the biggest thing, he's six foot two, which is not the biggest quarterback in the world. I wish he play action more. Doesn't have a huge arm, has a good enough arm, can make any throw when his feet are set. I have no argument with his arm. But I think of like Donovan, right, when he was running the West Coast. Like, if the pocket pinched around him, he could hang in there, hang in there, and he had that laser arm to throw open a receiver because he could hang in there and let them get open and throw a laser. Jalen will always, sometimes. when that pocket pinches around Jalen, his instinct is, I got to get out of, I, I can't stay in here. And first yeah. of all, he's got big old offensive linemen like Trey who are obstructing yeah. his vision. So, again, it's not a, I don't sit here and say, why don't they take Derrick Henry and line him up in the slot and throw the ball to him in a West Coast offense? Because he ain't built that way. Yeah. And that's not a knock. But when we kind of talk about Jalen Hurts and you say, well, he's not really built to stay in there as the pocket's pinching and then stay in there. People think you're knocking him. No, you're just trying to design an offense that is catered to his pedigree, which yeah. has always been to run, right? And his skill set, which is he's very good at. You want two things, make it comfortable and functional. Right. They get both from him out of the RPO. But one thing we should mention is what we talked about at the beginning of the show. They did a change up of you having them under center starting with the Raiders game last year. By the way, it really worked. It did work. They didn't get blown up because their offense couldn't move the football. Their, their, their defense couldn't stop anybody. Right. So it does work, and I'd like to see that. It doesn't have to be this week, but at some point, I'd like to see it as a change up. We're, we're making up a term here as far as an RPO offense. And now, I love it well, because that's what we're kind of doing right now, but that's just a wrinkle. Now, we're making it a part of the well, main, I, I, a main state. I think it's, it's more wrinkle. than a wrinkle in their offense. Yeah, I think I know, it was a wrinkle a, when they won the Super Bowl and Nick Foles would run RPOs yeah. every once in a while. I think the Eagles made it foundational, I think it's fair to say, for their offense. Yeah, for right now. I think for right now, is, yeah. 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 I think okay. a lot of it is based off of the RPO. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Because, right, I mean, I'm, you I'm have a line that you. can run. You can run the ball. And, and for you to be able to be successful as an RPO offense, you have to be able to run the ball. And these guys can do that. Right. The one thing I will say is that if I see another RPO called on third down, you know, third and five, third that and seven. That I don't like. Right. I just, I, I don't. Right. It's going to happen. It shouldn't. But, it's, but it's, it's, it's going to happen. That shouldn't happen. That when shouldn't he's happen. tucking Not the ball. Not when you got one or two. And the blitz is coming at him, right? It's, it, for, it's like a waste pass. of time. It's going to happen. I'm with you. RPO, I mean, like when you're literally tucking the ball well, as a fake and the defense is coming at you, you're wasting seconds see, that you see, can pass the see, ball. And in, in, in 17, <laughs> it was a changeup, right? RPOs? Yes. It, and by the way, Wentz was not the greatest at, at, the, at, the, at the handoff and then pulling it back. Yeah. That was one area where I know they would get on about it. Right. But look, it's, he's a two-week quarterback. We, we've talked about that for several weeks. But it's better than last season. I'm just interested to see as the season progresses, how much more do they give him? Because there's, there's, there's a lot of talent on this this football team that I think is untapped. I, I would say so. My thing is, like, if you make him a, a, a traditional pocket passer, and someone, I don't know if you want to do that with someone that sees the rush too much. 
What do you he mean? He pays by attention that? to the rush oh, yeah, a little yeah. too much. That's what I was talking Wait, about. When that pocket starts yeah. to pinch around, him, he's done. There. Yeah, so yeah. you may as well go ahead and let him move around a little bit in the pocket. Just move the pocket. Hey, get out there and do what you do. On his turn. And that's right. a, as a but good that. coach and as an offensive coordinator, that's what you want to do. You Absolutely. want to see what that player does well and cater the offense to him. I totally agree. Fair enough. All right. Jason Devon, why is Justin Jefferson one of the best receivers in the NFL? What does he do? Well, he makes people move out of their spot. Always equated to Allen Iverson crossing over Michael Jordan. Everybody remembers that play and it was iconic. He made Michael Jordan think he was going left and brought the crossover back. It's the same way a receiver. Receivers that can make you shift your weight to move out so they can run a straight line and understand that concept, whether it's at the bottom, off the line of scrimmage, or at the top, those guys are going to be successful. Now you add into that that he's a tall guy, you add into that he's a slender frame. When it's a slender guy, it's a hard target to hit because the guy is usually flexible in his torso and his upper body. So a lot of guys can't get a good, a good jam on him. And mm -hmm. also he can run. The dude can run. So, think, right. but, but, but making people move out of their spot is such an underrated skill to evaluate. It's, to me, it's catching and that. And then I look at how fast the guy can run. Because that's basically like what Jalen Rager is not good at. Right. It's not making people move out of their spot. What's interesting about what you just said is the Eagles were convinced he would never make it on the outside. They strictly was a slot receiver, which obviously was turned out to be completely wrong. And it wasn't just the GM, the head coach. There were coaches on, we reported this two years ago, there were coaches on Peterson's staff that in personnel meetings were like defiant. There's no way he'll make it. What, when you watch his I, tape, I, that's the dumbest thing I know. I've heard. I'm just telling you. Because <laughs> they didn't check his junior year tape when he won consistently what, what on the outside. What do you see that says he can only play inside? There was nothing that shows that. Just because a person is lined up in the slot in order to, um, you know, give the team the best chance to win at LSU, right? Yeah. Maybe their offense is dictated through the tight end, the slot, and also one receiver. And they're saying, okay, this X receiver is really not a mainstay in this offense. Let me put my better player in this position. And just because he has the ability to be diverse in that manner, you get penalized for it. When you line him up, he's open by five or seven yards every time in college. Right. I don't care what you say. All you have to see, this guy knows how to get open. He runs a 4-4-1. He's getting open against some of the best corners in the country in the SEC, but I'm going to go and grab the guy from TCU that never seen man coverage before. Like, it just doesn't make much sense at all. Well, on that note, while <laughs> right. you are correct on that, I will note that the Raiders, Broncos, and Cowboys also, also took receivers ahead of Justin Jefferson. We already true. know what happened Very with him. We don't need to rehash Henry Ruggs. Smoke crack, uh, you? Jer Jerry Judy and... <laughs> <laughs> Really You're wrong for that, man. <laughs> there were so many teams that didn't think There were other the teams that had questions about yeah. it. I mean, yeah. all those teams were wrong. A lot of those guys had, like, Jerry Judy is still an untapped talent. Like, I just think that he didn't have the, the quarterback play, so. That's fine, but yeah, I don't, yeah. I think, like, But if you it wasn't tell... CeeDee Lamb or Jerry Judy, I don't, I, I don't, there's no other way for me. Right. Yeah. All right. All right. By the way, great question from our Patreon subscriber. Tony Wright wants to know, does Jonathan Gannon try to match Darius Slay and Bradbury on diff on the receivers all night, or does he keep them oh, on their does sides? Oh, does he carry him? Does he carry that? I don't see that happening. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah, I really <laughs> don't see that happening. Like, in order for that to happen, the defensive back has to go to the coach uh -huh. and say, listen, we're going to play man-to-man -man this entire game, and the earnest of winning this ball game is on me. I've seen that happen a few times. But very rarely does a guy want all of that pressure. Right. That's the type of thing that you hear about the championship teams. I remember New England Patriots, they gave the story on ESPN, New England Patriots versus the, the, um, the Rams in the Super Bowl. Ty Law said, look, man, I want all these confusing defense. Me and Otis are going to stick these guys man to man the entire time. Mm -hmm. And they went out there and did it the entire game. You got to be ready for that. Right. It's, the defensive coordinator is not going to just have to put you on them. You right. got to go to them as Darius Slay and Bradbury and, and say, look, this is what I want to do. Sure, absolutely. Huh. All right. Because listen, if, 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 if a guy come in, defense, if a defensive player come in with that energy and say, look, coach, this is what we want to do. We better than them. We want to prove it to you. They're going to give you the opportunity. Even, even the coach kicked the Devin Hester one time. That was a bunch of players <laughs> in the Super Bowl saying, listen, we're going to stop this dude. All the players went to the coach and was like, yo, we're going to stop him on this first kick. Uh -huh. Now, they were wrong, and the coach went back and did his thing. But at least the players went to him and said something. <laughs>
that fun. Oh, that's, that's great. Fun. <laughs> wow. All right, we're winding down here at Jack's Bar and Grill at Rivers Casino. Everybody's having a great time. The sports book is filling up. People are placing their wagers. We are getting close to uh, talking a little bit about that line that spread and making our predictions. I just want to uh, sort of wrap up the show on this. We, we mentioned a little bit that the offensive line had some issues last week that were not just related to getting beaten, but also about some confusion as mm -hmm. to what the Lions were doing. They saw a lot of exotic blitzes, and there were a couple of times where there was a guy who was unabated to the quarterback, uh, as they like to say. Um, Jason Kelsey, their all-pro center, had some interesting things to say this week at his press conference, so I want to listen here. I want us to listen here to what the all-pro center had to say. Uh, you know, we have different ways of communicating environments like that, and I didn't take advantage of uh, the different tools to do that, which led to some problems, especially early on. So, uh, you know, that's an emphasis for us. Obviously, we'll be at home this week, but, I mean, the link can get pretty loud, too. So you got to be ready to be able to make sure everybody's on the same page. Uh, you know, I think if you look at the O-line, you know, when we were on the same page, it really wasn't that much going on in the game at the for the most part, guys are able to do their jobs physically. I think it's really just the communication aspect, and that's mostly my job. All right, that was the always candid Jason Kelsey kind of talking about some of the breakdowns on the offensive line against the Lions. And Trey, he took it upon himself. He said he wasn't loud enough. He was not communicating well enough as the center of the team to make sure that everybody was on the same page. So uh, he took some ownership there, but did you see – confusion up front or did you just see guys getting beat man to man how did you no, see some, some of the confusion up front where you're not sliding um, because uh, the only sack they gave up in this game was a corner uh, well a nickel came off the side right. and you just didn't slide I right. mean you know Kelsey they mugged the two linebackers up and they should have just went ahead and slide just slid the line uh, Lane should have been able to take him and then everybody pushes out to the next man that should have been picked up um, on the other one, I mean, you know, they brought the two linebackers up. You know, you have to, you know, you're going to have to take a chance on somebody. Guy comes off the corner. You know, they locked everybody up inside. They left the corner coming out. I mean, Hurts, he did his thing. You know, the heart read wasn't there, but he was able to get out of there. But to me, it just was some communication issues. And then, when you know, when, it's, when it is, in, when you're on the road and you're in a hostile environment like that, you do have to be loud. You have to be loud or you have to come up with some hand signals to kind of get it out there. But I think that with a, with a veteran group like this, I mean, that's something that these guys can bounce back from. And again, Kelsey didn't perform all throughout this training camp. Right. He wasn't there. Right. You know, right. So, right. you well, know, it's going to take a little time. You think maybe unscouted looks too? I don't know if they expected the Lions throwing that many kitchen sinks no, out there. No, I didn't no? think, you know, I, I'm thinking that had something to do with it as well. Because right. again, a, a lot of people didn't really show a lot during these preseason games. So sure. you didn't know sure. that you were going to go into a situation and have seven guys on the line of scrimmage and you got to figure out, all right, who's coming, who's not. Right. Yeah, no, right. And, and it was unsound too. It wasn't just yeah. that they were it wasn't just that they were blitzing. It was just things that you just don't expect when you have a running quarterback. Dude, like I, you, you, yeah. I would never expect anyone to blitz seven guys. Yeah. Most of the time it's six, five or six. But seven yeah. is, you know, that's not something that you see a lot. Yeah, you don't you don't see that. So that is an unscouted look. And the man coverage behind it sometimes, right? When you got a guy that can run, it's just, that's a principle. You can't have Azzalone thinking that he's going to, you know, tackle Jalen Hurts one-on-one, -on -one, and they did it a few times, scored a touchdown on it. Right. Hey, have you guys ever heard of the football player stock market? I yes. Have. You have? Yes. yes. Well, Mojo is getting in on this football player stock market. Mojo helps you turn your sports knowledge into real money by being the sports stock market. They got shares that entitle you to a guaranteed payout based on career ending stats. There's no off days, no off season. The share prices rise and fall constantly in real time based on career long projections. You can cash out anytime. You can build your portfolio up and buy and sell on your terms every play, every game, every season. So that's the mojo. You can get it on the app. Um, they're available in New Jersey on iOS. And just by downloading the app, you got a chance to win up to $10,000 in free shares of a player of player stock. You can get $10,000 of free share in Justin Jefferson, just through the mojo. Oh, I'll take that. Right? Yeah, I was gonna say, <laughs> something tells me the stock's gonna be going up and up and up on that. So if you click the link in the uh, description box here on the video after the show, you will find out how you can win up to $10,000 in free shares of player, player stock. You gotta be 21 or older. It, uh, you have to be physically located in New Jersey to trade up on Mojo. 
Uh, and if you've got a gambling problem, help is available at 1-800-GAMBLER. What, what Mojo stock would you buy? If you bought in Justin Jefferson right now, you're buying too high. That's who, too, who I, you buying I, I like your, your, your uh, Miles Sanders. He looked great last week. Yeah. yeah. He had 90 yards. In fact, remember, we, he only had 15 touches, only 13 carries. Right. Now he's shown that he's, the hamstring's good. He's not even on the injury report, by the way. Uh-huh. I like it. I, I would buy stock in, in Sanders for tonight. All right. Well, I mean, may come to mind that you might want to buy some player stock in? Kenny well. Gainwell. Kenny Gainwell, well, really. Wow. Well, like definitely would be cheap. I like him as a back, man. Penny stock? All right. Stock? <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> no. The Wolf of Broad Street. <laughs> yeah, mine would be like Lazard from the Packers or something like that. Where he scored no, last night. Yeah, yeah, where there's no other guy that you yeah. can throw to. Sure. He's going to get more balls. Sure. Stock price is low. Quez have any chance tonight? You think maybe a shot play? I field? just I, I wish they would use him more, but again, like the offense is going to be limited because you guys keep calling the RPO offense, right? So it's going to be limited <laughs> when it comes to how many guys they're going to be able to get the football. So you're only going to be you're only when that fourth guy, it's a tough position to be in. When I say the fourth, because you, he's the fourth passing option. So you got AJ That's Brown, true. you got Dallas, true. you got true. Devontae, whatever order you want to do that. That fourth guy is a tough deal. The only way he does get the ball, the quarterback is a high-level quarterback when it comes to reading defenses. And our guy isn't at that place yet, so it's hard to put, you know, some it, right. any stock in that, you know. There you go. All right. So make sure you check out the Mo download the Mojo app and start buying your stock in a player right now. Also, check out our friends at PHLSportsNation.com, enhancing the fans' experience with their coverage of all Philadelphia sports fans. Uh, I'm sorry, Philadelphia Sports. They are for the fan, by the fan. That's their motto. So check them out at phlsportsnation.com and on Twitter at phlsportsnation. All right, we are going to get to our player of the game prediction here. Uh, this is a really diverse set of uh, players of the game. Yeah. Here. Usually it's like quarterbacks and receivers, but we got some interesting ones. So Jason, I'm going to start with you. Who's going to be the player of the game tonight? I'm going to go with Miles Sanders. Okay. I think that he. Got his feet wet last week with, you know, getting some carries and some touches. And I think that the, the Vikings defense perennially lasts in the NFL and a lot of statistics last year when it comes to run defense or close to it, close to the bottom of the league. And I don't think that's been addressed this offseason. Um, so I think that um, Miles Sanders should have a good game. All right. Trey, who's the player again? Slim Reaper, man, with, the, with his Easter suit on today. You know? <laughs> Slim Reaper. I think that, you know, especially coming off of last week's game, you know, I think that they're, they're going to force the ball to him. Yeah, you know? force it to him. Make sure, make sure the We're going to get you some up. catches today, yeah. baby. Let's go get it, Slim Absolutely. Reaper. Absolutely. It, right. it should be. It should be. First, <laughs> first two or three, right? First two, two or three players going straight to him. Oh, yeah. Good pick. Adam, who's the player of the game? I'm going to throw a change up. The guy played well against the pass last week, not so much against the run, but. Kaiser White, who tremendous training camp, tremendous offseason. They're finally going to get one of these one-year deal guys right. Uh -huh. He's going to be the one. In fact, he'll have to cover Dalvin Cook out of the backfield. He, he, he sets a lot of traffic. Really good football player. This is going to wind up being a really good signing. Again, it's a changeup. Kaiser White. So when you make a linebacker your player of the game, you're thinking a couple of forced fumbles, maybe yeah, a pick. Yeah, I think it's going to be a big game. Uh, might get a pick. Get a, turn, a turnover. Yeah. Drop in its own drop. Because, oh, uh, mine was right last week. Nobody gave me credit all week. Who'd you have? AJ Brown. Oh, gosh. Oh, he went out on a limb there. <laughs> hey, listen. Nobody else picked him. It's the first game ever, I was though. Last, you know, and true. I was the last pick. That is true. And no one else picked him, and I was the last one to pick him. I was right, too, though. Alright, Greg Cosell weighed in. He has Adam Thielen tonight as his player of the game. Right I went with Dalvin Cook. I'm not convinced this run defense is just going to rectify its wrongs. And uh, I, like I said earlier, I think Adam doesn't necessarily. If I'm Kevin O'Connell, I am running the ball five to six times on the first nine to ten plays just yeah. to see if the Eagles can stop it. And then if I'm successful, then I'm starting to air it out, but I'm trying to take advantage of what the Lions did last week. Different, different offensive scheme, but it, it's going to be fascinating to see the approach of both teams. This, this game is so even. By the way, the weather cleared up. I guess there was a little bit of a storm around 5 o'clock. It's fine. Oh, yeah, was The wind is gone. It, it, it's not going to be a factor. The, the fans are going to be out of their minds. It's Monday night football. Both teams won week one. You got, you, you got this, uh, the Vikings with their new staff. It's going to be hard for Kevin O'Connell. It's going to be hard. Coming in here, the first game outdoors. Sure. This is going to be fun tonight. This is a very even game. It'll be All a right. tough one. 28 running 
28 um, carries for running backs for the Vikings last week. 28 carries for running backs. They got, big, they got a big you know, early. We, we don't yeah. do that much. We, we always include Hurts' runners in, into yes. it. But 28 runs from just the running back, that's that's a lot of pressure on defense. That is a lot. That is a lot. And watch out for that Alexander Madison because he's a very nice changeup with big yeah. dude to come in and rumble through the line. All right, we are uh, going to take one last look at the line in total and make our predictions. But first, I got to tell everybody that the food from Jack's, right here at Jack's Bar and Grill, is now available at Bet River Sportsbook every weekend and for every bird's home game or every bird's game. They got specials like $2 Miller Lights, $15 bottomless chips and salsa, $12 pretzel bites, and $16 easy peel shrimp. Now, there's also the home field advantage spin and win contest. Betters who place a qualifying game day bet in the Bet River Sportsbook can enter the spin to win contest held every home game by placing at least a $50 bet on pro football. The maximum number of entries is three, uh, per wager is three per transaction. Eight winners are pulled via random drawing to spin the wheel. Prizes include free play, cash, and two tickets to an Eagles home game. If the birds win, two more winners are selected. All right, don't forget about the Choose the Champs weekly pick'em contest. All Rush Rewards members get one free entry each week. You got free play prizes awarded to the top 20 finishers with first place winning $1,000 in free play. And in September only, they got the 88,000 River of Clubs Challenge where guests earn entries all month long. You just activate your entries starting at 6.30 on drawing days. Drawings are Fridays and Saturdays at 8 p.m. and 10 p.m. Five winners from each drawing pick an envelope with either cash or a free play prize. If you reveal a club, you win a group bonus or cash progressive bonuses. That's all that here at Rivers Casino and Sportsbook, where Philly loves a winner. All right, so let's get to this line here. Now, last we saw, the Eagles were two point fit. I'm telling you, it was four, then it was three, then it was two and a half. In our last look on the Bet Rivers app, it was two with an over under of 50, unless it has moved to 49 and a half, which it was uh, going into the day. So, Jason, I'll start with you. Who wins? 30 27 birds win. Close one. 30 to 20. A little Jake Elliott action in the last a little uh, Jake minute. Jake Elliott maybe? action to win the game. All right. Birds by a field goal. Trey? I'm going 21 20. I think it's going to be a tough one, man. 21 20. Yeah, 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 I, make, right, right. I can never pick us to lose. Okay. I just can't do it. I'm sorry. I remember know, two I years have. ago when it was four four win season. You got a few uh, yeah, Eagles. I can't do it. I can't pick us to lose, man. <laughs> I have us going undefeated until we not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Eagles win 21 20. Another close one. Uh, Adam, who wins this game? I got a 23 20 birds. I got to be the bad guy, don't I, huh? Are you I, really good? Knew it was I got to be the bad guy. Slant, when I, I remember one time all of us picked the Eagles and you picked the other team, you were right. So. 49ers, week two. Okay. okay. Well, we I am see, not on an they island. Shouldn't have, they shouldn't have won the game. And this is week two. Uh oh. I'm not on an island. Greg Cosell has also weighed in and he has the Vikings winning 31 28. Ooh, high score. I have the Vikings winning 26 23. So we are all in at least a very close game. So it should be very exciting tonight. Remember, you can bet the game right here at Rivers Casino and Sportsbook or on the Bet Rivers app. Big thanks to Rivers. Thanks to Sky Motor Cars, the teams at Rebel Hill, and Public Square. Thanks to Jason Avant. Thanks to Trey Thomas. Pinch hitting for Greg Cosell. Does a great job for Adam Kaplan, Jeff Mosher. Make sure you're checking out our coverage on InsideTheBirds.com. Make sure you check out the Inside the Birds live post-game show with myself, Adam, and Trey Thomas. Everybody, enjoy the game! Birds. Birds. Oh.